in Monday's schedule of the Pioneer Faith Institute Fellows induction ceremony. Um, I should have, we should have asked for permission to so just to let you know that this meeting will be recorded. So um, I hope that's okay with everyone on the call. My name is Amaka Wokolo. I head the Faith Institute, which is the research policy and advocacy arm of Faith Foundation, leading innovative thinking and creating platforms to enable idea exchange and problem solving strategies to foster sustainable entrepreneurship in Nigeria. Today, we are celebrating and inducting the pioneer class of senior Faith Institute fellows. And we would also be listening to our very special guest speakers who will be sharing from their wealth of experience and providing guidance to our fellows on the call today. Now, the Faith Institute Fellowship Program is a two-year program designed to bring together, showcase, and support policy experts, economists, and academia with fresh thinking and innovative approaches to tackling entrepreneurship issues in Nigeria. When we launched the program in March this year, we were looking for candidates with a strong research background, experience in influencing policy, and a passion to drive policy change using innovative approaches and thinking. We had an initial applicant pool of 132 applicants and over about three months, three to four months, we went through a three-stage shortlisting process that led to the selection of our distinguished fellows who will be unveiled very shortly. Coming up next will be opening remarks, the unveiling of the fellows, and then we'll listen to the keynote address followed by our other guest speakers. We would also have a brief interactive question and answer segment after the speakers. So please use the Q&A box to share your questions as the conversation progresses. I also encourage you to please use the chat box to introduce yourselves, where you're from, the organizations you represent, and just engage with people on the call. Now to deliver the opening remarks, um, please join me in welcoming Ms. Shelly Bella, but I need to confirm that she's on the call because we had um, a bit of a technical glitch. Um, is Mrs. Bella on the call? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so I'm just going to invite and welcome on board or welcome to the floor, the executive, executive director of Faith Foundation, Adenike Adeyemi, who will take the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Amaka, and good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning to all our guests joining us on our Faith Fellows induction program. And a special good morning to our fellows who were inducting today and also to our special guest speakers. I can already see Mrs. Aisha Abubakar and Dr. Jumoke Oduwole on the call. Uh, you're all very welcome and we're quite excited to have you and we're honored to have you uh, join us at this uh, program. We started the Faith Foundation Research and Policy Department, what is now known as the Faith Institute about seven, eight years ago. And for us, the, the, the focus was first at that time to start um, as a way to providing data and insights that would influence our work within our Faith School of Entrepreneurship. So as most of you would know, uh, Faith Foundation is a 22 year old uh, nonprofit founded by Mr. Fola Diola and focusing on enabling aspiring and emerging Nigerian entrepreneurs to start, grow and scale their businesses. When we, um, after 15 years on in doing this work, we then started to make sure to look for insights that will help us in our program design, curriculum design, and everything we did from our pre-incubation, incubation, and growth programs. And then we then started to look for insights from the ecosystem, um, first to even understand the policy space, the policies that um, were already in place, or being planned for micro and small medium enterprises in Nigeria at the national level and also at the sub-national level. 
And then we were also looking for research uh, and information that would also give us a sense of the evolving entrepreneurship space, which was and continues to significantly evolve um, and provide pointers on what we also needed to do uh, to improve our program. And we, we then had a session where we brought in a lot of all our entrepreneurs from across um, um, the states in Nigeria at the time. And they, they gave us feedback on certain things, but we did not see um, external data to influence that. So that led to the start of our research and policy department, which has now evolved, evolved into what is now the Faith Institute. And so the Faith Institute you see today really channels all our data, our insights, our po policy um, advocacy work and our policy dialogue work and expands it, not just even for us at Faith Foundation, but even as we share that with others in the space. Um, one of the things we do again right now, for instance, is collaborate with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group's MSME Community of Practice uh, as a way again of understanding what's happening in the ecosystem and partnering with public sector, private sector, development sector um, in this regard. So as we continue to do this work, we realized that there were other people who were also as researchers, academia, and even practitioners in the space who in their different um, roles and, and, and levels um, were either doing work actively um, to showcase um, insights from programs and policies that have been implemented and also even advocating for specific things. And in that regard, we then set up the Faith Institute fellows uh, who we're launching today and who will be showcasing the six fellows with which we uh, with which we shortlisted through the uh, process. Um, so on behalf of the board and management of Faith Foundation and the Faith Institute, I really like to welcome all of us here for this um, board, uh, for this inauguration session that we're having. And we, we know it's going to be a very interactive and insightful one, not just for our fellows, but for everyone that is joining, you know, as we seek to, in our different ways, work and collaborate together, um, not just to showcase insights, but to have a thriving um, and enabling environment for those who are on the path of entrepreneurship as they create jobs, impact livelihoods, create innovative solutions, products and services, um, and really add value in driving the economy um, as a whole, not just at the national level, but even at the sub-national level. So once again, uh, you're welcome everyone, and we're glad to, to have you here. Thank you. Um, I will now go ahead to introducing our fellows um, that we have um, in our inaugural class of fellows. And as I'm introducing each and every one of them, um, we will be spotlighting them so that you can see their faces. So I, I will be asking that our IT team and the fellows also get ready um, as I do this introduction. So in introducing our faith fellows, the first fellow I will be introducing is Dr. Ayodele Shitu. Dr. Ayodele Shitu. Great. So Dr. Ayodele Shitu is here with me. Please can we spotlight him? Thank you very much. So Dr. Ayodele Shitu um, is an economist and entrepreneurship coach who joined the Department of Economics at the University of Lagos as an assistant lecturer in 2010, and then became a lecturer when he returned from the Suchow University um, in China, where he was awarded with a PhD in economics in 2014, uh, as he specialized in the economics of entrepreneurship and innovation. His sectoral focus areas are the informal sector, retail, fashion, and FFCGs, while his fellowship interest areas are on youth entrepreneurship, innovation, university industry collaborations, and academic entrepreneurship. He won the Matassa Fellowship in 2016 for his contributions to the advancement of knowledge of youth entrepreneurship in Africa, and he is an active member of the African Network for Economics of Learning, Innovation, and Competence Building Systems, and the Network of Economics of Learning in, and, and, and Competence Building Systems in Nigeria. My apologies. He is, a, he is a lecturer, a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics and the Deputy Director of Entrepreneurship and Skills Development Center at the University of Lagos. Nigeria. 
congratulations, Dr. Shitu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Our second fellow who I will be introducing is Jonathan Obina Ikeolumba. Jonathan is a certified chartered accountant, a finance consultant, and an accredited national business development service provider with 15 years experience across several roles in financial management and business consulting. His sectoral interest areas are education, retail, fashion, FMCG, while his fellowship focus areas are access to finance, policy and regulation, and women-led businesses. Jonathan is currently the managing partner of Office Lord Consulting and a member of the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants, ACCA, and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He also serves as a member of the finance faculty of key enterprise development institutes in Nigeria, such as the Faith Foundation School of Entrepreneurship, and the Enterprise Development Center of the Pan-Atlantic University. He works to build the finance capabilities of MSMEs in Nigeria, and particularly for the purpose of our fellowship, is currently a finance doctoral candidate at the University of Lagos Business School. Congratulations, Jonathan, and you're, you're formally welcome to the fellowship program. Thank you, it's just a privilege to be among the fellows. Thank you so much, I'm grateful. Thank you. The third fellow uh, that I will be introducing uh, today um, is Moturayo Akinshola. Moturayo is a researcher and lecturer at the Mountaintop University, where she and she obtained a bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from the University of Lagos in 2008 and 2012, respect, respectively. She recently concluded a PhD program at the University of South Africa and is a grant recipient of the PhD thesis grant program of the African Economic Research Consortium, AERC. Our studies in the Department of Economics within the University of Lagos and the University of South Africa focuses on economics and econometrics and its application in many fields. Her sectoral focus areas for the fellowship are manufacturing and education, while our main focus areas will be on access to markets, youth-led business, and policy and regulation. Motorayo has over 10 internationally recognized publications, and she co-authored a book chapter, Intra-African Trade and Innovation in the Agricultural Sector, in the book titled Innovation, regional integration and development in Africa, which highlights investment opportunities in agriculture in Africa uh, for micro, small and medium enterprises. Congratulations, Motoraya, you're welcome you. to the fellowship program. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be among the friends. Thank you. Thank you, Motoraya. Our fourth fellow who I'll be introducing is Omo Shalewa Olawoye. Omo Shalewa is an assistant professor in the business and society program of the Department of Social Science at York University. She has a PhD in economics and social science consortium from the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Her sectoral focus areas are agriculture, fishery and forestry, and education. While her fellowship focus areas are policy and regulation, youth-led businesses and access to finance. She has conducted research on various issues such as monetary policy, housing, natural resources, fiscal policy, gender, youth development and, in youth development and inequality. In 2014, she was handpicked by Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner, as one of the 20 graduate students for an annual advanced workshop on inequality. Omo Shalewa has published books, journals, and newsletters, and has supervised graduate students' research and dissertation. She co edited the book Monetary Policy and Central Banking New Directions in Post Keynesian Theory in 2012, and is currently editing a book on COVID 19 and the response of central banks coping with challenges in sub Saharan Africa. Congratulations, Omo Shalewa. 
You're welcome to our fellowship program. Thank you very much, Adenike. It's glad to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. Thank you. Our fifth fellow is Real One Bola Gade Aderito. Real One has a BSc in statistics and three masters of science degrees in business administration, managerial psychology, research and public policy from the University of Ibadan and also from Enugu State University of Science and Technology. Real One is currently the lead consultant at Market Site Consultancy Limited and has worked on key projects with leading public sector development partners and corporates and also with the Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria in areas around public policy analysis, impact assessment, monitoring and evaluation, SME business development support, and microfinancing. His key sectoral focus, focus areas include retail, fashion, FMCG, and education, while his fellowship focus areas are policy and regulation, access to finance, youth-led businesses, and access to markets. Real One is presently a doctoral candidate at the University of Ibadan with a focus and specialization in public policy. You're welcome, Real One. Congratulations. You're on mute. Your microphone is on mute. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. You're welcome, Real One. We're glad to have you. And our sixth and last fellow um, that is on our fellowship program uh, that we're launching today is Wilson Erumebo. Wilson is a senior economist at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, NESG, where he leads several high-level research and advocacy projects, such as the NESG Macroeconomic Outlook Report and the, and the NESG Osiwa Debt Management Roundtable Project. Wilson's sectoral interest areas are manufacturing and education with his fellowship focus areas on access to markets, youth-led businesses, policy, and regulation. Wilson's career goal is to support the growth and development of the Nigerian economy through research, policy, advocacy, and advisory services. He has provided business and economic insights as well as research services to organizations, uh, including local and international corporates, bilateral organizations and development sector organizations. Wilson is a recipient of the Award on Distinctive Leadership and Reform Initiatives in Economic and Policy Development in Nigeria, and was among the first cohort of Global Scholars Program at the US-based Academic Standards Against Poverty. Wilson has a master's degree in economics from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, and is a PhD researcher in economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. Congratulations, Wilson, on being part of our Pioneer Fellows Institute. You're welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, thank you. So again, congratulations to all our six fellows who are, um, as, who are, who are Pioneer Research Fellows. We're really, really excited to have them here. And uh, we are happy that we have um, not just Faith Foundation, but other um, individuals joining us um, on this inauguration. I am now going to swiftly introduce our keynote speaker for today. Our keynote speaker is someone who is very special to Faith Foundation and who also has been one of the founding individuals uh, who has supported Faith Foundation from our start in 2000 and to date. Mr. Aswe Igodalo is a founding partner of Bambo and Igodalo and chairs several private and public sector organizations and institutions, including the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. It's also important for me to note that Mr. Igodalo was previously the chair of our Communications and Advocacy Committee, which ensured the strategies that set up our Research and Policy Institute and what has now evolved to our Faith Institute. And we're very happy to have him here to give a charge 
to our grad to our pioneer see i almost said graduating to our pioneer faith institute fellows and really provide the perspective for which their two-year fellowship program um, will be will be will be charted through mr godalo i hand over to you and you're welcome uh, to please give our keynote address thank you very much sir thank you nika you're a bit biased you know all those flowing things you said about me, but thank you so much. Uh, and I'm actually, um, I'm going to say it again in my speech, but before I start talking, I'm actually very honored and privileged to be um, giving this address. I won't call it keynotes, just giving this address and just talking generally um, about issues around entrepreneurship and what I expect the fellows to do. Um, because it's an area in which we've had very serious problems over the years. And I'm really so glad that they didn't care that the FATE board, um, even after we left the board, continued with this work and the Institute has become so formidable. So congratulations to the board, congratulations to you and congratulations to Amaka. Thank um, you, sir. One more thing in talking about things I'm proud about is that um, I saw the um, CVs of your first six and the truly formidable. Truly, and I didn't expect any less from fate, knowing fate and our standards at fate. And again, um, I, I have a particular soft spot for one of the six, who is actually one of my people. Uh, but now they've all become my people. So I congratulate the six and I say, well done to fate. Um, I prepared a paper and I say I have only 25 minutes. So I'm gonna rush through it. Um, I got carried away working on it and then working with my guys in, in um, at the NS, NESG, because once they knew I was talking to Faith on this, they also wanted to put in their top pens into my paper. So they were trying to barge in, but I'll try and make it as short as possible um, in the time frame that I have. I welcome everybody this morning. Um, I welcome everybody. For me, it's, um, I'm truly happy, I'm very proud because it's the outcome of many years of serious work at the Faith Foundation. So I specifically welcome the board and management of the Faith Foundation, our captains of industry, distinguished heads of ministries and departments who have collaborated and supported with us at the Faith Foundation over 20 odd years, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship program managers, members of the international community, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and then in particular, our fellows, our today's fellows. I welcome you all. I'm excited and I'm deeply honored, but I'm particularly very excited to be asked to give this address. Um, and I thank you very much Nike and the board and Amaka. At this auspicious event of the induction ceremony of the Fate Institute Fellows Program, something that's truly dear to my heart. Again, I congratulate the fellows as they embark on what I see as a very tasking, but socially and economically rewarding journey to support policy design, research, review, our implementation processes and address critical gaps, limiting the potential of the Nigerian entrepreneurship system. It's going to be a lot of very hard work, but looking at how far you guys have come, I know that you will more than justify your selection as the first set, as our pioneer set of fellows. As we all well know, the Nigerian entrepreneurship ecosystem has been a significant backbone of the Nigerian economy. Regardless the headwinds, the deep incompetencies and inefficiencies in our environment, this ecosystem has and continues to sustain our economy. Indeed, I think we've survived based on this ecosystem. According to the most recent report of the National Bureau of Statistics, the MBS, micro, small, and medium enterprises, the MSMEs, account for 49.8% of Nigeria's gross domestic product and constitute a significant share 
of the total number of businesses in Nigeria. In addition, MSMEs account for about 85% of total industrial employment and are spread across all sectors of the economy. According to the Fate Institute 2021 State of Entrepreneurship in Nigeria report, entrepreneurs are endemic across the retail trade, fashion, FMCG, agriculture, hospitality and hotel, advertising and marketing, entertainment and events, small scale manufacturing, digital, media and communications, healthcare, education and training. These businesses have been instrumental in providing creative solutions, innovative ideas, and value creation in the sectors where they operate, cutting across various sectors of the Nigerian economy. Beyond the quantitative metrics, the sector has also contributed to positioning Nigeria on the global map. As reported in September 2021, Nigeria presently has the highest number of female entrepreneurs globally, reinforcing the entrepreneurial spirit of most Nigerians. Besides their high economic value, MSMEs have been drivers of social change in Nigeria. The last few years, we have seen several innovative solutions in critical sectors, such as education and healthcare. These solutions have leveraged technology to link consumers and clients to markets and service providers, thereby breaking traditional barriers of infrastructure deficits, communication gaps, and logistic bottlenecks. From the formal to the informal sectors, the deployment of technology to the traditional approach and the contributions of entrepreneurs has been immense. Sadly, Despite the significant, significant contributions of entrepreneurs at every level, the business environment and major gaps in policy implementation have stunted their potential. In addition, the emergence of COVID-19 two years ago, its attendant comorbidities, our current macroeconomic instabilities, and our securities in the country uh, insecurities in the country have worsened the situation across all sectors of the Nigerian economy. According to the 2021 State of Entrepreneurship in Nigeria report, and I quote, traditionally limited access to capital, high interest rates, infrastructure deficits, inadequate power supply, lack of evidence-based policies, limited access to finance, lack of incentives and institutional support, policy and regulatory inconsistency, and implementation dysfunctionalities top the list of challenges facing small businesses in Nigeria. To make matters worse, insecurity has now become a major barrier to the growth of small businesses in Nigeria. These businesses operate in a highly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment, what we now call VUCA, the VUCA environment, characterized by unpredictable policy changes, making it very difficult to do business in Nigeria. So how did we get here? What has been done to develop and support the entrepreneurial ecosystem, given the importance of entrepreneurs and MSMEs in our economy. What must we do, what must be done to create an enabling environment for entrepreneurs to thrive? How has the government supported or provided a cushion to hedge against headwinds? And these questions are for you, our fellows, because as you start to work, you'll need to think very deeply about these questions I raised and other questions that are raised. Over the years, as a country, to deal with the funding issue, which many of us, and which we know is probably the major problem in this sector. So to deal with the various funding issues, 
and support initiatives for entrepreneurs, which I will speak about in detail later, we established different programs. However, one of the effectively coordinated efforts <clears throat> at the federal level towards supporting MSMEs commenced with the establishment of the Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria, which we know as SMEDA, which was enacted through the SMEDA Act in 2003. And it had the mandate to stimulate, monitor, and coordinate development of MSMEs, initiate and articulate policy ideas for small and medium enterprises growth, promote and facilitate development programs, serve as the vanguard for rural industrialization, poverty reduction, job creation, and enhanced livelihoods, promote and provide access to industrial infrastructure, intermediate between SMS, MSMEs and governments, and work in contact with other institutions in both public and private sectors to create a suitable enabling environment for business in general and MSMEs in particular. One of the critical outcomes of this Medan mandate was the development of the first national policy on MSMEs in 2007, and also another in 2010. And we've had subsequent reviews since then. There was also a collaboration between Smedan and the National Bureau of Statistics to create the first MBS Smedan survey to drive evidence-based policy advocacy, which is going to be a lot of the work that the fellows will be doing. The second NBS Medan survey was subsequently conducted in 2013. We have had periodic releases of the survey jointly released by NBS and SMIDA. Thus, on one hand, we have the data. On the other hand, we have policies, again, sadly, with grave lim limitations on scope, coverage, and implementation. With the data as evidence, there's been no doubt that a nurtured, well-structured MSME subsector driven by entrepreneurs would contribute significantly to employment generation, security, wealth creation, poverty reduction, accelerated rural development, and sustainable economic growth. Consequently, in 2013, with all of this at the back of our minds, the National Enterprise Development Program was developed to generate an estimated 5 million direct and indirect jobs between 2013 and 2015, with a focus on skills acquisition, entrepreneurship, business development service, and access to finance. The entrepreneurship training business development service component was implemented under the one local government, one product platform. The access to finance component by the Bank of Industry and the skills acquisition component was implemented by the Industrial Training Fund. Some benefits accrued from this initiative. However, there are questions of accessibility, accountability, implementation, as with all our other funding initiatives. The access to funding challenge has consistently been touted as one of the significant challenges pervading Nigeria's entrepreneurship ecosystem. According to the PwC 2020 MSME survey, obtaining finance is the most pressing challenge for micro, small, and medium enterprises. PwC estimates that the financing gap for Nigerian MSMEs is about 617.3 billion annually, and that was pre-COVID. According to a 2018 statistic of the Central Bank, only 0.3% of total commercial bank credit was availed to small businesses. Also, less than 5% of small businesses have access to adequate finance for working capital, 
funding business growth. And this was according to the National Bureau of Statistics. Over the years, and I'll jump over this so we don't spend too much time on it, but I can see from our research that since about 1955 to date, the federal, state, and then it was regional actually, regional, federal, then state governments have been involved in different funding initiatives, starting in 1956 with the Federal Loans Board, which was established by the Colonial Department to support the indemnization of private enterprise. Straight up to our recent trader money, market money, farmer money, um, and Jeep initiatives. And in between all of these funding interventions, that's over a period of nearly 70 years, Institutions were also created by government to manage and disburse the funds from DBN to BOI to Bank of Agriculture um, to World Bank guided projects. But sadly, and for me, truly very sadly, especially when you do the work in this area and you see the amount of resources, financial manpower that has gone to trying to fund this sector and catalyze growth in this sector. Very sadly, due to our own implementation dysfunctionalities, competencies, bad staffing, wrong staffing, lack of focus, policy inconsistencies, all of these interventions, initiatives, and funding policies have had only limited impact on the ecosystem. And so, fellows, this is an area in which we will seriously need to look at as you do your work. How do we make our funding interventions and initiatives and support, how do we make them work in this climate? How? Regardless of our dysfunctionalities, it's hard. Let me talk a bit about opportunities. I've talked about where we haven't done very well, especially as regards our funding initiatives. But regardless that we haven't done well, regardless the problems that are there, you see the strength of entrepreneurs, particularly in our small and business areas where they start off and they thrive the most in upholding our economy, both informal and formal. And when you look at what's happening at the top there, you begin to wonder how the country is standing. And if you look deep back, you will see that the country is standing on the pillars of our entrepreneurs and our small business people. And there's still the opportunities, regardless of the problem. And the problems, I have said it, uh, are plenty. Regardless of these plenty problems, there are still opportunities. And I'm truly an optimist. And I believe there's room for optimism. And in doing your work, dear fellows, I look forward and expect you to also look at those areas where the candle is shining brightly or where the candle can shine brightly. So I'll look at opportunity areas and we will have to devise a mechanism where our entrepreneurs and small business people can take advantage of these opportunities. We have opportunities in the export markets. And I will talk about the little problems we have that also affect those opportunities. But we have to look beyond those problems and create a way to either remove the problems or work around the problem. So we have an opportunity in the export markets. In 2020, we exported 39.1 billion worth of products and services. And our exports have declined since then at about 5.2 every per year. And this decline in exports has also been a drag on our economic growth. Non-oil exports declined by 0.5% annually over the past five years, falling below the global average growth. But our imports have totaled 63.3 billion. So immediately there's a nearly 30 billion gap. And we have this wide trade deficit. 
Whilst this is a problem, and we can see that from our fiscals, it's also a great opportunity for entrepreneurs, for our small, medium-sized, and even our, and our big businesses. Because of the 63.3% worth of imports, without doing much hard work, even the CBN notes that we have the potentiality to achieve full sufficiency in 25 billion of the 63. So if you subtract 25 from 63, our gap deficit reduces to just about five. And if you do a lot more research, I'm sure we'll find that we can have sufficiency in much more. So we need to push our entrepreneurs and we need to push our medium-sized businesses and, and our big businesses to look straight at exports. Look at the export markets, creating value, creating quality. It's tough to be competitive, but when it gets really tough, the tough get really going. And that's where we have to get through. And our fellows, you have to help us think through a mechanism for this. A major problem is that we continue to be low complexity economy. In other words, we do not manufacture and export complex products at scale. And therefore, we do not earn any significant foreign exchange for manufacturing. If we are to drag ourselves out of our present economic issues, we must upscale manufacturing for exports. While we struggle with our own unique monetary policy inconsistencies, our unorthodox economic management, we at the NESG keep highlighting that the country does not export the volume of moderate to highly complex products that drive a diversified export revenue base to sufficiently create non-oil resilience that will buffer our foreign reserves. This is an entrepreneurship problem. I know that our entrepreneurs will push back and say that the enabling environment is not conducive. And truly it is not. But like I said earlier, when the going gets tough, the tough must get going. We are the only ones that can save our country. And those that have been blessed with the skills to think ahead and be visionary must utilize those skills regardless the headwinds. So the capacity of our enterprises to transform our raw materials into finished or processed exportable products must be heightened because at present it is so low. This gives and creates great opportunities for those who can chest out and take the challenge. If for instance, we compare Nigeria to Indonesia, a country which is similar to our own, we'll find that over the last 30 years, Indonesia mobilized its entrepreneurial e ecosystem from low complexity products to high complexity products and diversified its revenues and focus on exports. The narrative of this comparison is this, that a network of well-organized, well-connected and integrated medium enterprises and entrepreneurs within who are situated within business clusters through formalization in that country. And we can do the same here. Secondly, still talking about opportunities, an export orientation also accelerates technology know-how and enables us to become more competitive to compete globally. This is also an opportunity. Thirdly, there's an opportunity for capital formation. One of the contributions that the MSME sector added to the Indonesia economy is that it accelerated the development of other asset classes. We can do the same here. Fourthly, there's an opportunity for policy entrepreneurship. In the countries that seem to progress, particularly in the last 50 to 60 years, there's an agreement that entrepreneurial leaders must be given the space to define the boundaries of what is possible. The policy, legislation, and regulations then come later. So they were not stunted by regulation by people that didn't even understand the complexities of value creation. 
there's plenty of opportunities for the Nigerian entrepreneurial ecosystem to benefit from ideas that allow market formation, market convergence, and strategic leaps that drive exponential economic growth across sectors. The country needs policymakers that spend time meeting with businesses that innovate, that spend time also meeting with form policy formulators that think so that we can drive productivity at scale. This is the kind of policy entrepreneurship that I hope our fellows, our inaugural fellows at the Fate Institute will pay significant attention to. You cannot afford to just sit behind your screen only looking at spreadsheets and analytical data. You must go and see and talk and discuss and find out. Go out and learn from the entrepreneurial practitioners across the ecosystem about what solutions will work for us at scale and how they think we can deal with our problems. It is also critical that you devise how these solutions will be implemented and made to work. Many of you will agree that in our country, we have answers and solutions for everything. I'm sure if you go to some ministries, you will see documents there that are from first class minds. For some reason, our implementation capacity has been totally negative. In closing, I seek to suggest and summarize the realistic priorities required to aggressively and effectively fuel our ecosystem. I have talked extensively about access to finance and our financing initiative over the years. Dear fellows, dear fellows, dear fellows, you must come up with a process and implementation system that will make entrepreneurship financing work and work efficiently and corruption free in Nigeria. My first big charge to you. Incentives must be devised to encourage the private sector and net savers to channel funds into this ecosystem in an efficient and non-stressful way. We must also incentivize the provision of alternate power sources, especially in our business clusters. So people who think through how to provide alternate power sources should be rewarded or incentivized. Government must be forced to pay attention to our routes to markets and our routes to ports. Our export processes must be simplified, made corruption free and made more efficient. As difficult as, as it is to envisage, considering the long drawn ASU strike, we must return to establishing vocational institutions and running them well. These truly, dear fellows, are irreducible minimums if we want to forge an entrepreneurship ecosystem that will propel inclusive growth. To the Faith Institute, let me just say one word. From my experience at the NESG, from experience generally, research, policy, advocacy policy, support, and collaboration work can be very, very frustrating and seemingly a thankless job, especially when you are in an environment populated by policymakers who do not understand or appreciate the impact of the work we do. But you must not relent and you must never give up. You must strive to be a world-class institute working and collaborating with the best minds available. Ultimately, ultimately, we always see the fruits of our labor. And I'll tell you a little story here. For those of you who are familiar with the NESG, you may know this story. During um, President Obasanjo's tenure, the NESG pushed for a reform of the Nigerian pension scheme. 
The first time we went to talk to the old general, he chased us out of his office, calling us thieves. You know, Baba had this only, only thing for everything he didn't understand. However, we had data and we had done our homework and knew that ahead of us, if we carried out reforms, um, there was going to be transformational change to the Nigerian landscape. If we carried out pension reforms. So we did not back down. We kept going to Baba. And after a while, he stopped calling us only and he stopped to listen. And that's the good thing about him, you know. Um, when you can persuade him, your argument is superior, he bows, which is good in a leader, I guess. And the rest is now history, as they say. We had the Pension Reform Act. And we can see the impact of that act in our lives today. So please, Faith Institute, never give up. Even when people are sniding, backbiting, saying, what I think is this guy, they just talk, talk shop. Never give up. Stay focused. You know what you're doing. And you continue doing it. And you know, when some people give you attitude that they're more Nigerian than you, don't give up. You know, nobody, don't let anybody ever make you feel they're more Nigerian than you just because they sit in a place where they can make policy. Sometimes they don't even have a clue. But be humble and be focused and diplomatic in the way you approach those you seek to work with. To our dear fellows, today's inductees, again, congratulations. Over the next 20 months, you will engage we expect you to engage, and I know you will, because of the character and caliber of persons you are. You will engage in cerebral work of immense proportions with the capacity and opportunity to produce transformational work that will benefit our dear country, and which, if put in the right hands, will catalyze inclusive economic growth. I charge the six of you to please seize the moment. Your work must indeed be transformational. And I repeat that. Your work must indeed be transformational. Once you have done your work, it is now left to the rest of us, Nigerian citizens, to vote into office capable hands with the capacity to effectively understand and implement your policy recommendations and your work, and thereby start the process of jumpstarting our economy and pulling our great country back from the brink. The time you are coming to do this work is so fundamental in our history. Let me leave you with these immortal and thought-provoking words of Victor Hugo, and you've heard it many times. Nothing is stronger than an idea whose time has come. Armies cannot stop an idea whose time has come. For the Faith Institute, time has come for this idea. And there's nothing better than now. I thank you all for listening. And I say to you, our inductees, go out and prove the quality, the capacity, and the intellectual strength that the Almighty has given the six of you and bring forth truly transformational work. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, thank you very, very much, sir. Um, I don't know if you can see all of us, but there's a roaring round of applause just going on in the background. It's, um, this has been really powerful, if I can use the term. Um, thank you very much, sir, for that in-depth and thorough paper on linking entrepreneurship and social economic impact, um, highlighting the gaps, the priorities, and the opportunities. You really took us on the journey, highlighting the strengths of our entrepreneurs, also talking about the gaps because we're being realistic. There are a lot of issues that exist within the ecosystem. You highlighted this uh, specifically the access to funding, the access to finance gap. You also talked about the opportunities around exports, you know, policy entrepreneurship, 
you give a charge to our fellows, give a charge to us at Faith Institute, give a charge to everyone on call with regards to making the right decision when it comes to choosing our leaders. This has been really thorough and in-depth. And honestly, sir, we are truly grateful and appreciative for, you know, just sharing, first of all, sharing your time and the wealth of your experience and spending your time with us. Thank you so very much, sir. Um, I think we have a couple of questions, particularly from our fellows. So, sir, if you would indulge me, I will take a couple of them. I had um, a hand up by Ayodele Shitu. So, Ayodele, if you want to take the floor, um, the floor is yours to ask your question or share your comment. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, indeed, it's a blessing to have you present the keynote speech today. I am particularly delighted, given the fact that uh, you have charged us and uh, we have been uh, encouraged to come up with transformational work that will catalyze inclusive growth. Thus, my question, sir, you, as one of your policy suggestions in the direction of our research is a vocational, the rejuvenation of a vocational institutions in the country. Building on your own experiences, sir, and the crave for university education in this country, how well do you think young people can be inspired to look in that direction of acquiring vocational skills for an inclusive growth, especially at the local levels. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll call you prof. All right, sir, so we'll take all the questions. Okay, you want to take all the questions? Okay, sorry, but let me just yes, quickly respond to I, prof. Uh, just this one very okay. quickly, then I'll take all the others. Because that, for me, that's a truly brilliant question. And I've scratched my head, you know, not just because of the problems we have in the academic space, but because our people think that anything less than a university um, is not worth it's not worth it, you know. So it's going to be truly difficult. Um, it's not going to be only money based because I know that many people that have vocational skills and much more than people that have that are going to university. So it's not about we need to find a way in which we, as a people, need to make people know and feel comfortable with the fact that they didn't truly go to university. And there are many great men that didn't go to university, men and women, who have achieved phenomenal things, you know, um, both here in Nigeria, many and abroad. And we need to bring them out as role models. But it's a, I think it's a difficult question, you know, our mentality in our environment, you know, we've lost sense of values. And, you know, we need to talk about this big time. And I'll go back and I've had conversations with um, Mrs. Adi Aminike on this many times before. You know, we have to go back to the fundamentals of our problems. And we have to go back to value systems in the homes, seriously. Parents have to um, change the mindset and particularly not just spend good quality time on shaping the girl child and allowing the boy child to just um, wander around. Uh, and that's causing social problems. But we have to go back to the value system and let people know that we, our vocational people shouldn't come from Ghana, Togo, even as far away as Zimbabwe. You know, um, we need them here. And we had those schools before. And we need to start talking about it. And we need to start celebrating our successful people who necessarily didn't spend time in university. But it's a tough question because our mindset has changed. You know, we've become warped. And Nigeria is not going to fully change until we bring back value system. You know, that's the best I can do now. It is tough, you know. People just, everybody, whether you have the intellect, the capacity, the ability, everybody just pushes everybody to university. And it's, it's difficult for you to tell somebody that their own child shouldn't go to university, that child should go to a, a vocational school. But that's the fundamental of any system that wants to develop. So and we have to go back to the basics. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so I'm going to take Mrs. Aisha Abubakar. She's actually one of our special guests. But I see her hand up and she has a question or a comment. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you, Amaka. And um, thank you, Mr. Oigado. I just wanted to add to, to that question about um, change of mindset when it comes to um, when it comes to vocational studies. Um, 
I have been opportune to go to Netherlands to see where the university institutions have built um, sections for practicals, for vocational studies, you know, to feed into the private sector. And I'm sure this is something we can emulate in Nigeria. Uh, conversation have been ongoing with NECA and um, ITF and so on, but I, I, I don't know what is going on. But as you said, we really need to go back to do that mind change. Um, to, our technology universities, our polytechnics, are ideally meant to complement students who are in vocational studies. And there's nothing that says you cannot earn a degree while doing that. It's a matter of phasing it out. So maybe after two years or three years of doing a vocational uh, course, you can go on and qualify with a degree. Nothing is impossible. It's just, as you said, the mindset. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, so I have three hands up. Um, We'll quickly take the questions back to back, and I would appreciate if you can keep it as succinct as possible um, so that we can move on quickly. So, Jonathan um, Otunrayo and then Obosha Lewa in that order. So, Jonathan, the floor is yours. All right. Um, just also to say um, thanks a lot for the session we just had and very inspiring for us as fellows. I wanted to ask a question on something that I know is quite um, germane at a time like this now. And that is the issue around, you know, this um, JAPA syndrome. Um, I, I speak a lot to a lot of SMEs who are struggling to sort of create growth structures and a big problem for a lot of them now is, you know, just having the human resource, you know, to just stay with them and allow the business idea flourish and grow. So I just want to get your thoughts on that sort of um, issue around this move to uh, find resource and then you're not sure how long this resource will stay with you in trying to grow your business. It might be easy for the bigger businesses to deal with that, but for a small business, you know, what are your thoughts on what some of them can do? You know, that, that was just my question. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So really just um, tips on how to mitigate challenges around human resources, considering that a lot of people are leaving the country now. Thank you. Um, Mutumayo? Hello Mutumayo, you're on mute if you're speaking. Okay, we'll quickly move to um, Shalawa. All right. Um, thank you so much for um, the uh, uh, speech this morning. And I just wanted to highlight some, one statement you made that has kind of sent my mind um, into a kind of journey. But you made a statement about finding policies that would help financing in a corruption-free way. Those were your words. And, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, um, I'm trying to wonder how that is possible because um, I don't even want to say Nigeria, the world in general, like when you're talking money, money is one thing that corrupts people very easily. So um, if, if there's something you know that I think you should share with us, especially because I'm going to be working on the finance part. So if there's something I'm missing, um, please, I would like you to share it here because I really don't know how that would work in a corruption-free way. Minimize okay. corruption, I get, but the free corruption-free, I'm struggling with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Muturaya, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you for the eye-opening um, speech. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm particularly in interested in the low and complexity economy of Nigeria. You mentioned, because I'm, I'm working uh, in the manufacturing sector. So um, Nigeria is actually very, in terms of um, our product, we have a low complexity. And I know there is a data, there is a data on that by Harvard Institute. Um, I would like to know what we can, you know, what policies can we put in place? I know we are doing very well in terms of uh, technology in the financial sector, but other sectors are actually struggling. 
So I'm looking at what we can do, especially in the manufacturing sector areas. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, sir, just a recap. The first question was really looking at um, human resources. So how to tackle that from a policy perspective? And the next question was around working on access to finance models or solutions in a corrupt free Nigeria. Um, and then um, looking at manufacturing, just policies that can help build that uh, sector, especially because we see how technology is being applied um, in other sectors and delivered outcomes. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Let me start with uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, this jackpot problem eh, is a big problem for all of us, a big problem, big problem. Um, I've lost a number of staff myself and in other organizations I'm associated with. But it's not a new problem. You know, um, if you, if some of us that go back as far as 1983, 84, ironically, we had the same person as head of state as we have as president now. But if you go back to 1983, 84, um, that's when we used to call Andrew. So um, Andrew preceded Jaffa. Whenever the state of an economy denies us hope and denies people hope, um, the human tendency, especially for those who have capacity, is to carry their resources and their capacity elsewhere. And it will continue to happen until we create a, a country and an environment that's secure. Parents have the opportunity to bring up their children in a safe, uh, well-educating, good healthcare environment where we have infrastructure that works. And different people have different tolerance levels. And for different people, different emotional attachments. So first of all, the people with the least emotional attachments who have the capacity go first, then the people with the low tolerance levels, and then other people who think that um, they have a better opportunity elsewhere. And you know, I can't, I don't um, tell people not to go. I tell people about the pros and cons. And I tell people that Nigeria will get better. And I tell people that it's good you're there as Nigeria is getting better and you're part of the system. Because I have 60, 70 year old friends now who are trying to come back, particularly those who are Andrew. And the cost of reentry is so high for them and it's so sad. You know, and they say they don't want to live their last days out there. Because no matter how far and how long you go for, that yearning to come back is still there. But for as long as the economy is in the tail speed that it's in, for as long as people don't see hope, and the thing is truly hope. You know, for as long as people see hope, they take their chances. When people are not quite clear about the direction of hope, or if there's even hope, then it's more difficult for people. People go as far away as to the coldest parts of Canada. You know, and the only thing that can drive people to do that, people that have been living in hot sun Nigeria, is hope. You know, is that there is no hope, you know? So again, I go back, all these things are in our hands. You know, we must start coming back to a point where we look at what our issues are as a country. And clearly leadership is a major issue. And until we all talk about this leadership issue and try and encourage people to look at the important issues, not the 20,000 or 50,000 during the election cycle, or the person is from my village or from my church or whatever, you know, and look at what the real issues are. We will keep having this problem, Jonathan, it will keep coming. And then, you know, what even worsened it, what we didn't have in 84 that we have today is the insecurity. There are many of us here who, you know, in those days, particularly when we were in university, some of us in university in the 70s, we could get up from one town and travel to another at night without fearing anything except having a flat tire. We, you know, you can, even if you are mad, you can't even try it today. You know? you know, there must be something driving you beyond madness for you to even try that today. And people are beginning to think that the Lagos area is probably the only truly safe area. And I'm touching wood, and that's comparative. You know, so the insecurity drives people. You're not sure that if you go out of your, you know, people drive through traffic at 7 p.m. and they're molested, accosted, you know. Um, how many people have the stomach to go through that three times? By the time you've gone through that three times in six months, you start processing your Canadian application. You know, so that's it. So it's a whole package. 
And I hear you, but you can't stop training people, especially if you want to build a first class institution. You can't because you suspect they will go, say you won't train them. Then you better be doing just a one man business. I don't know what business you can do that only one man can do. So you trust yourself. You, know, you just have to take chances. The other thing is that you have to make your people comfortable working with you. You don't have a, you, know, you, you may not be able to compete with those who are going to earn dollars or pounds sterling. But you know, there'll be those who at the cusp, who because they work in a great environment, in a great place to work, respected by the people they work with, um, paid reasonably well in the circumstances. Nobody can be paid well in Nigeria anymore, you know, with the way inflation is going. But paid reasonably well in the circumstances. Um, and then respected and well cared for and allowed to do their work in dignity and in confidence, they'll, you'll find that you won't lose as many as other people do. You will lose a few, but you must keep training. Part of your work now is to keep training and training. So maybe you look at the pyramid structure and at the bottom, you take a lot more than you need and then you train. And hopefully you'll get a chunk of them staying, okay? But you can't avoid it because the minute you stop training, your institution dies. And that's not what that's not the idea. So it's a challenge for now. If the rest of us do what we are supposed to do well and we get good leadership in the environment, it'll get better. Okay. But for the next couple of years, we really have to roll up our sleeves. And we also even how our house helps, you know, disappear. And you find out that they've gone. I had a friend told me that. He, he lost his house help to Ivory Coast, you know, far away Ivory Coast, you know. So the opportunities, and you know, in the UK now, they're looking for all kinds of talents, all kinds of skills, you know, in Canada, in America, since Brexit, we're now competing very seriously with um, staffing in the UK at all levels, you know, IT staff, you know, at first it was low level IT staff, now it's all the whiskeys, they're gone. And then even, even lawyers, you know, even lawyers. So things are truly bad, you know, but you must keep going. Um, Shalewa, corruption free. Yeah, I, that for me uh, is, I, I want to set that as the ultimate goal. You know, many people think that we can't have a corruption free environment. And I'll take you back to a little story when I was, and that's not long, you know, a few people may remember it. And if they don't, they may have read about it. When I was growing up in the early 60s, and we used to travel from one town to the other, you know, we'll get to a store where they're selling yam, plantain, and things like that. And there'll be only one tiny child there. And the tiny child will tell you that her mother is selling the wares for 10 shillings or whatever. You count the 10 shillings and you give it to the child. You take your exact wares and you go. So we were not born in Nigeria to be to think corruption or to try and do things in corrupt ways or to try and do things in slipshod ways or to try and do things um, jumping the gun or whatever. No. So it's part of when I started talking about the orienting uh, value system. Why we are in trouble on the entrepreneurship front and the medium small scale front and that's why I took time to enumerate all of the initiatives since the 50s. It's because these initiatives didn't work. If you just come back to our recent intervention policies and all that. Now, let me ask you, did they work? And if I ask you another question, why didn't they work? If they were done properly, okay, the right people apply. You say what you want to use the money for. You say how you're going to staff your work. You say when you're going to pay back. And then you're given the complete money you applied for. You're given the appropriate interest rate. And you, are, you channel the money to the business. You say you, and you know, the corruption is on both sides, not just one side. Even the people applying plan to be corrupt, the people giving plan to give corruptly. You know, so we, get, we have to go back to the value system. And you know, it can be done. And so if we have zero tolerance, and everybody in their sphere should show zero tolerance for corruption. Everybody keeps thinking it's a way of life. It's not our way of life. I grew up, you know, basic things. You know, you grew up, somebody comes to visit you in your home, your parents is asking, what do their parents do? And if you cannot justifiably understand what their parents do, your parents cannot allow you to be friends with them. Simple. I go to secondary school, I come back with my suitcase. 
You know, I can't come, you mustn't see somebody's pencil that's not mine. Pencil, pencil, my suitcase, I'm toast. So we can go back. And it's when we go back to those values uh, that you will see that the giver will focus on giving and we wish you well in your investments. And the giver is not looking to the fact that you're going to use the money to make money and start looking and coveting what you are going to do. And the taker, truly wants to work with the money. So until we go back to the value, that's why you know, it's, we have a hard road to go, hard slog, but all of us must contribute to that, to achieving that hard slog. That's it. I don't have any silver bullet for you. I always go back to the values. And I say, and we start from home. Mothers particularly spoil their boys. That's a problem. They think it's the girls that must be responsible. And I'm seeing around, extremely responsible girls. If you look in the entrepreneurial space, and I said it, Nigeria has the highest globally number of entrepreneurial women. And I see young girls, 21 to 35, you know, serious entrepreneurs. And I see the young boys, all of them waiting for one hammer. What's the meaning of one hammer? What does one hammer mean in an environment that wants to grow? So I see these girls really doing all sorts of things from IT down to, you know, and you don't, but you ask the boys what they're doing. They don't want to work in a structured environment. Okay, that's fine. Be an entrepreneur. They haven't thought through any entrepreneurial program. That's fine. Okay, so what do you want to do? Nothing. They want to hammer. How do you hammer? So women, yeah. and I notice it's the mothers that do the spoiling the more. So we go back. So it's a value thing. It's a value thing. And we, we, need, to, we, need, to, we need to sort that out. You know? Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah, I'm taking I'm too sorry, long. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. so I'm no, done. We're enjoying Mot you. Moturayo, no complexity. You. No, no, no. Moturayo, now you are going to lose because I, I know all the long talk. I wanted to talk now. Uh, Amaka has, uh, Amaka has, uh, has, uh, I'm very sorry, sir. <laughs> she, she shortened my time, but I'm I don't know. Sorry, I, sometimes sir. I get carried away because these issues I'm very passionate about, extremely passionate, and we need to go back to the ground floor. Um, in com yeah, we we don't add value. Everybody wants to do the easy thing, you know. You want to just um, you want to take the cocoa. You don't want to do chocolate. You just want to do cocoa powder or something silly and think you export it and you don't get good value. So a lot of us complain that because our environment is competitive, we can't add complex value. That's not true. That's really not true. You know what we need to look at is our environment is a high cost, non competitive environment. So how do I minimize my costing and take advantage of low cost points? Many of us don't even do that, you know? We don't take advantage of low cost points. We're not prudent in our financing modeling. And I think there are, there are areas where we can be competitive internationally and we can add true value and good value. If Ghana can be making chocolates that's going international, that's the reason why we couldn't have done this in Nigeria a long time ago. So we need just to, to think outside the box. We need to expand the horizons of our thinking. And you know, we don't like working hard in Nigeria anymore. That's what I see. If you think hard and work hard, you no, know, the sky is the limit. So I don't agree that our, our non-competitive environment makes us work much harder and think much harder, but we can add great value to our base resources such that we can capture the returns from selling those resources. We're not capturing the return at all. We can't even refine oil. And we've been trying, we've been trying to build, to rebuild our refineries for 40 years. And we're giving the contract to the people that don't know about how to do turnaround maintenance for refineries. So how can we get the refinery working? So we need to get the right people in the right place, proper staffing and do things properly and let people be ready to work. So let's be ready to work. And I think I'll stop there because Amaka is sending me signals. We're not, we're not <laughs> working as well. And that's why I charge you fellows. You guys truly need to roll up your sleeves. You really need to think through. So your brain is working. Your mind is working. Everything about you is working. You're talking to each other. You're sharing opinions. You're talking to other people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're making your thinking sharpen so that when you come out with your end product, you'll be useful and fit for purpose. And but more importantly, we need to get people that will use your end product. So we all need to work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I think that for me, what I'm taking away from this latter part of the conversation is really that we are not a corrupt people. So it's not ingrained in us. And really, we can actually keep this out. Thank you very much, sir, for re-emphasizing that. We appreciate your time and thank you for spending part of your Monday with us. Um, moving on quickly, I'm going to welcome and invite our next speaker, um, who is Dr. Jumoke Ujuwale. Um, Dr. Jumoke Ujuwale is Special Advisor to the President of Ease of Doing Business at the Office of the Vice President. She's also the Executive Secretary of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, PEBEC, chaired by His Excellency Vice President Yemi Oshibajo where policies aimed at supporting small and medium-sized enterprises across various sectors of the economy have facilitated to make Nigeria a progressively easier place to do business. Dr. Oduwale and her team have collaborated relentlessly with all arms and levels of government, as well as the private sector, to deliver critical homegrown reforms over the last six years, such as the reenactment of the Companies and Allied Matters Act, Kama 2020, and the inaugural subnational ease of doing business baseline survey for all 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. Prior to her career in public service, Dr. Uduwale was a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, with expertise in the area of international economic law. She joined academia after a career in investment and corporate banking at FCMB Capital Markets, a division of First City Monument, First City Monument Bank PLC, and Guarantee Trust Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jiboke Oduwale, who would be speaking on partnering with government to facilitate evidence-based policy strategies. Hello, ma'am, if you can hear me, you have the floor. I can Thank hear you. you. I can hear you. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here this Monday morning or now afternoon. I'd like to thank Mrs. Nikki Adiem for the kind invitation and huge congratulations to all the fellows. Um, it's, it's, it's really nice to be back in, in an academic sphere. Uh, since 2017, I've been on leave of absence from University of Lagos, Faculty of Law, where you heard I, I'm a law teacher in international economic law. So coming back to be with fellows is, is interesting and, and part of how I joined um, or raised up my hand to work in, in the policy space and in policy implementation is because uh, I was writing on negotiation strategy and a lot to do with developing countries and development. And I kept writing for policymakers. I mean, every, almost every paper I published, the end, the recommendations are to policymakers. So when I had the opportunity or when I knew His Excellency was, was going to be the vice president, I immediately put up my hand and, and put a short um, note together and said, you know what, I'm ready to jump into the ring. So thank you for this opportunity, the nexus between partnering with government to facilitate and uh, deliver on evidence-based policy strategies. Before I jump into the presentation, I'd like to give a special shout out to Mr. Asui Godalo. He's one of, I mean, he's, he's my brother. I, I don't even say that. Um, he's probably gone off the call, but there are few people that have supported me personally in this journey in public sector, and he's certainly most one of them. Always, always, always giving feedback and always having long conversations like what he shared with us this morning. Uh, but beyond that, even as a firm, he's put his money where his mouth is. We had from the inception of the Presidential and Living Business Environment Secretariat, we had a partner level resource stay with us for three years during the first term and continue to volunteer with us and support us technically in our legal cluster. So I'd like to thank Mr. Aswe Godalo and Bangwe Godalo for always being there for the PEVEC Secretariat. Now, when I looked at this topic uh, with my team, I was like, okay, partnering with government, to facilitate evidence-based policy strategies. I said, you know, what, what is Nikkei thinking? What are they thinking about right now? I know that they know a bit about what we do at the PEVEC Secretariat, but I decided though I'm an academic, like, like the, the number of the fellows being inducted today to take a more pragmatic and practical approach 
kind of using the perfect secretariat as a case study of what partnering with government really can mean on the ground and in a practical way. So we put together a deck that will take you through, next slide please, that will take you through, no, the, the content please, yes. That will take you through an introduction of the project and then the reform tools that we've used to de deliver on the reforms and what we've been able to deliver so far. And then we'll talk a bit about perfect partnerships so you can see in practical terms how and who has partnered with government or continues to partner using our case as a, as a study, and then we can take it from there with Q&A. Thank you. Next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know, and I see that a number of you may not know, some of you are in the country, some of you are not, but the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council is, is a council that was inaugurated in July 2016 by the president. It's chaired by the vice president, and the mandate was twofold. At the time, there was a huge uh, trust deficit. There still is to, to a large extent, but we believe we've dented it uh, somewhat. A huge trust deficit between private sector and public sector and, and the government. And, and the idea of whether or not government even cared or listened to private sector. And then there was a perception problem as well, uh, using a, a number of rankings and, and just seeing where Nigeria was all the way back at about 170 out of 190 countries. So we were in the company of countries like Somalia and other war-torn countries at the time. And um, the government decided to have a coordinated approach, next slide please, to approaching the problem. It's not that no, no government had done anything before, but when the efforts are decimated, the impact is not able to be felt. So the council chaired by the vice president has about nine, uh, 13 now other ministers on, on the council, Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, so the, the line minister, and, and indeed um, my sister, the Honorable Minister of State, the former Honorable Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment, a founding member of the council, and another pillar of support, another pillar of support. So I'm glad that she's, she's probably still on the call right now. I'd just like to say hello to, to her as well. So we have the, also the secretary to the government, the head of service, the central bank governor. And very quickly, we realized that we needed to collaborate with other arms and levels of government. So we, we added on representation from the National Assembly and the judiciary, and then uh, the state government, and most recently the, gov the local government, uh, starting with AMAC in Abuja, the area municipal council, and of course, private sector. So the secretariat is where the uh, agenda of the PEBEC is implemented by a team of, non, of young Nigerians, and I'll speak a bit more about the Secretariat later. So um, the model is basically the Secretariat implements the model, the, the mandate reports to the council and the council reports to FEC. Next slide, please. We also cascaded it to the sub-national level. So from 2017, uh, presented to the National Economic Council, also chaired by His Excellency the Vice President, and the states unanimously agreed to adopt the PEBEC model. So every state has, apart from its, its um, state reform champion that, that um, liaises with us at the Secretariat, they also have a team on ease of doing business now and a state ease of doing business council. So just replicating the model of collaboration and cohesion uh, so that we can feel the, the powerful, the impactful beam of reforms for MSMEs. Next slide, please. So the project in its entirety is focused on MSMEs, as Mr. Gudalu had mentioned, just under 50% of GDP, but by far the majority of, of that uh, is made up of micro and nano businesses. So we, we, we highlighted for a number of reasons about six priority sectors, decentralized power, transport and logistics was added during COVID. Technology has been a driver of Nigerian economy, particularly the younger demographic, the creative sector. We know all what that's doing in the world today. Like manufacturing, I heard one of you say we're working on manufacturing and agribusiness. These are the areas where we feel for a number of reasons for the youth bulge, for the unemployment, for the, for the growth, high growth rates in these areas and for what they contribute to the economy we decided to prioritize these six sectors. Next slide, please. So we work on a range of things, and, and this is about what we call the snake slide that just summarizes 
in essence, it's been six years now, six years of work. Uh, we work very closely with the National Assembly, uh, Mr. Godalo, um, and other people have talked about the Companies and Land Matters Act. It's a landmark, the largest legislation for, for private sector in Nigeria that was first enacted in 1990 and hadn't been overhauled in over 30 years. We worked with a large range of stakeholders for about three years and were able to get that um, through the National Assembly twice and assented into, into law. We also right now have an omnibus bill on business facilitation that has just passed second reading at the Senate. It's passed first reading at the House. And that was also a collaborative effort that Mr. Igodalo, as, as um, chair of the section of business law, Nigerian uh, Bar Association, then sort of handed over a charge. And Oluak Pata, who was his successor, who is actually now the, the president of the Bar Association. Uh, we started that work way back in 2018 and we're able to partner with NESG, uh, NASPA, that's the Senate's Business Roundtable, the Corporate Affairs, just a huge amount of stakeholders and law firms, over, over 40 law firms worked pro bono on this and of course with Ministry of Justice. So the Omnibus Bill is, is one that consolidates, a, uh, it's a tool that has been used in different parts of the world, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Kenya, Mauritius, to scoop up uh, legacy challenges in the in the legislative environment and clean that up. So we're, we're applying that for the first time in Nigeria. We also have our judicial intervention. We worked with the Court of Appeal to have electronic access to their judgments. And then we've been working with different states. We're about seven states strong now that have instituted small claims courts across the country, which is expedited access to judgment, about 60 days, 90 plus execution, where there can be self-representation, simplified rules of evidence. So that judicial intervention is also going really well. Now, I spoke a bit about the subnational intervention with state governments. We have a number of things we, we've been releasing or we've released the inaugural edition, a baseline edition of, of our own Nigerian Ease of Doing Business report last year in 2021. And in October, we'll be releasing the second iteration of that report. It's based on, on data gathered from MSMEs across the country and then other surveys or other inputs like from Smedan and Bureau of Statistics, but mainly from interviews and, and surveys conducted on MSMEs around the country. We also have a program that we're just instituting with the World Bank. Uh, also, we've been working on this from about 2019, thinking through how we can enable states and help them with technical assistance to deliver more of these reforms. And the envelope of the SABRE program is about $750 million over a three year period. And it's a program for results. The first of this scale that the World Bank will be going into around the world. And so all states are on board, whichever state plugs in has the opportunity to be reimbursed up to $52.5 million over the three year period. So it's something that's going to deepen when you come uh, talk about land administration, when you talk about uh, PPP frameworks, um, access to fiber optic to digitize the economy. Maybe I'll just talk a bit about it later on, depending on how far we get to go. Uh, FGN regulators, um, we all know a number of the challenges. So we've, we've worked quite significantly with our regulatory agencies. We work with 55 of them at the PEBEC Secretariat. We have one of our, our inception reports, the cost of compliance pilot that I'll mention a bit later on as well. The executive order 001 is the first executive order of this administration on transparency and efficiency of public service delivery. And that EO1 has been a landmark and, and I'll, I'll speak about it a bit later as well. We've actually had international recognition just from, from uh, the innovations around some of the work that we do. Um, and of course, working with private sector, strategic communication is always a big part. Report.gov.ng, our reporting portal, and the, the backbone of that with MSMEs, uh, working with them to be able to use the portal, and the MDAs, working with them to have a robust response system to address complaints. AFCFTA, we know that AFCFTA is live, and where does Nigeria fit in? Really domiciled under the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. And we work closely with them to just support and follow up on how they are doing in terms of implementing. There's an AFCFTA secretariat 
and the area of trade facilitation, like our ports, reforms, our customs. So in a nutshell, that's like six years of work. I'll go into some of them a bit deeper as I go on with the presentation. Some I may speak to maybe during a Q and A. Next slide, please. So this is just some of the empirical evidence. Now we've, we've completed well over 160 reforms. We've been recognized by the World Bank. Um, we've had tangible, uh, measurable results. And um, let's go on. This also just talks about how we moved up in the World Bank is of doing business rankings. We were twice recognized as a top 10 global reformer. And just the, the process, I'm, 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 I can come back to the impact and the results, but I'd like to spend more time on telling you how we were able to achieve this and where we stand with things right now. Next slide, please. Yeah, let's go on to the how, yes. So uh, talking about how PEBEC has delivered measurable impact, we've used a lot of automation. So we've worked with uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. We've worked with Corporate Affairs Commission to automate the company a registration process to link with payment of taxes. We've automated the filing and payment of taxes, business registration names. We've automated visas on arrival. We've automated uh, just the development of the collateral registry. And that's also one of the, the leading legislations that we got through the National Assembly. So there are a number of things that automation has delivered. Regulatory reviews have delivered. Um, we work on people issues, we work on process issues, and to a lesser extent, infrastructure. The ministers on the council have some accountability for some of the infrastructure, but we focus mainly on soft infrastructure. Next slide, please more of the legislative interventions. I spoke about some of them earlier. Next slide, please. So how we do what we do. Um, discussions like this are, 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 are some of the ways we start ideation. So just thinking through what are the problems and, and a large amount of stakeholder engagement, a large amount of, of research, uh, policy research, and looking at how things are being done across the world, comparative analysis, um, deciphering what is done here and chronicling who does what, how, why does it take 10 steps here? Why does it take three steps elsewhere or five steps? Uh, comparing with different uh, levels of, of economic advancement, comparing with OECD, comparing with, with BRICS, comparing with the uh, ECOWAS region, geographical proximity. Uh, so the team has a lot of research component behind the policy making and the ideation and then working with the MDAs that deliver the reforms and uh, trying to negotiate space mentally, uh, showing them what and how things are done in different areas. And then speaking with private sector a lot because if we, if we design a shoe without checking where it's pinching for the, for the wear of the shoe, then there's really no point. So in terms of prioritizing what gets done because we try not to uh, boil the ocean or swallow an elephant. So you need to also prioritize and take things step by step. Next slide, please. So this is a leading tool. Uh, we've been globally recognized for this, been asked to come and speak in Dubai and DC about how Nigeria has used this particular tool. It's called the 60 day accelerator, uh, national action plans. There are 60 day accelerators that we use to deliver accel uh, uh, a rapid fire of reforms, usually once a year. The first year we tried twice and there was too much uh, reform fatigue, that was in 2017. So we reduced to once a year in Q1 of every year. So we've made some traction. We've had some reform fatigue, some challenges. During COVID, we had some, some reforms um, unwinding, but all in all, having a very specific way to do what you do. There's a whole, we work with an, a, a strategic plan for the year that the PEBEC approves around October. And then we start, or September, October, then we start uh, discussing and working with the ministries, departments, and agencies, uh, and engaging with the private sector, stakeholder engagement, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, looking through the, the reports that are coming through the report, uh, gov.ng, and then also called, called uh, unsolicited reports that just come. Also coming social media and just the news in general 
and, and keeping tabs on where the, the pain points are. So we distill those into and prioritize them and then work with the ministries, departments and agencies at the federal level and sometimes at the state level as well to determine what we would focus on in a particular national action plan for the year. Then the, the plan is announced at the beginning and the objectives are announced and then at midway. And so you know who was able to do what and who wasn't able to do what. So now this is about policy making and policy implementation. You don't always get the outcomes, but this is the process and, and what that means or, or doesn't mean. Sometimes we put in 100% uh, return on effort, maybe as low as 10% or less, and maybe as high as, as 100%. So it's also uh, contextualized in the larger framework of all the issues that Mr. Idodalo already uh, raised, but I wouldn't bother repeating for the, for the purpose of time. Next slide, please. So we have uh, the executive order one that I spoke with, I spoke about the first executive order, and we make a point of tracking the implementation. So it was signed in 2017, and since then we've kept a report on that. They're all available online on our website. And so you can really see which agencies are working hard. And we acknowledge the top five agencies and the top five most improved agencies. And we announced this publicly, it's, it's uh, launched at the PEBEC. And it, what this helps to do is to help MDAs have a framework within which to track their own progress and not just um, be shooting in the dark or shooting independently or thinking what they're doing or not doing is working or not working. Not every MDA has been as responsive to reforms as others, but the ones that have been responsive can actually see the progress year on year. And the ones that haven't been responsive, but we just give them zero and we announce it publicly. So there's also the reputational risk attached to, to the implementation of EO1 directives. Next slide, please. Hello, Dr. Dwele. Um, yes. So I just wanted to let you know, you have about three, four minutes before we go to Q&A. No, I'm sorry, that wouldn't be. Because <laughs> you invited me here and you gave me a time and I logged in at exactly 11 o'clock and I sat there. So out of respect, you will listen because no, I want the I, fellows no, to know I see, I see, what I the see, work has I done. You okay? Okay. And I love listening to of you, course, Mr. A. Of course, so we, we will listen. We yes. listen. You know, faith, eh? <laughs> today is the day for the inductees. Let the inductees, let them soak knowledge, wisdom. Exactly. Let them, so let them soak, okay? Yeah. So, um, uh, Amaka, you and uh, Denike, don't make this one of this your, this your sharp, sharp, sharp thing. Okay? There's just the no doctors. point. I had to rearrange okay. a lot, Nick, uh, to be here. <laughs> exactly. And we had to yeah. write this thing. We had to spend yeah. time writing things. And I want the inductees to know that's the most important thing. This see, is my, one of the see, few. My sister, my sister, <laughs> as a former board member, I override both of them. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Godaro. So, just for the inductees, just the importance of capturing data and tracking things. These are our annual reports. These are also some of the reports that we've done just in response. The, the cost of compliance, that's the fourth one. That's a pilot survey that was done in Lagos and the FCT because we were hearing something from private sector that didn't have to do with the cost of, of taxation. Um, the regulatory costs and just not knowing where to get enough information. Uh, so you can be a tech company and set up and start your business and after year one or year two, you just have this uh, sort of license. Maybe you're in broadcasting and maybe uh, broadcasting corporation comes to you and says, you have to buy this license, you have to pay for this, something that you didn't have visuals on. So we, we interviewed a number of firms and we got some of the information that we're then feeding back to the federal government to say, look, somebody has to have visuals on all what MDAs are collecting from private sector, this is not taxation, this is the cost of regulation. And it's so high in some sectors that it's crippling the sector, going over 70, uh, over 50%, and we have to do something and look at that. I already talked about the uh, National um, Ease of Doing Business report. We started this even before the World Bank uh, discontinued their World Ease of Doing Business rankings. So this was a really opportune and good time for Nigeria. And it covers all the states and the FCT. Next slide, please. 
So I've talked a bit about subnational. I talked about saver. So I'll I'll leave this next slide, please. So report gov um, is something. It, it's a portal that we that has helped private sector to be able to send in reports. We've we've solved reports for MSMEs. They don't need to know anybody. They don't need to know the minister. They don't need to know anyone on the team. So we've actually met MSMEs that tell us, oh, I sent in something and report gov. And it, it took a lot of work to get the portal. We, we needed private sector. When I talk about partnerships, you'll see how. And then getting the MDAs ready at the back end before we even launched it or pushing it in terms of strategic communication and to the public, getting the back end ready because there's no use launching a portal and the back end. We had to take it to FEC to get a 72 hour response time. And it's not that it's all rosy, but these are some of the steps that you need to take to put sort of founded building blocks to be able to get the policies actually implemented. Next slide, please. So stakeholder engagements, literation is a tool that was targeted at young people. This started at Lagos State. Uh, we, we had a kickoff event at Lagos State. The governors attend, speak to the audience, take the heat, take the questions and have to answer them. And they're there with their teams, their cabinet, their MDAs. So quite a bit of traction came out of this. We went around about uh, seven locations and it was, a, it was just COVID and Lassa fever that, that slowed things down. But we continued again with Jigawa earlier this year. Next slide, please. So Pebec Awards is how we, we recognize and encourage the MDAs, uh, the public servants and civil servants aren't really well paid. Um, there's not a lot we can do to support them in terms of financials. Uh, but what we do is encourage them and recognize their work and recognize their efforts. So these are some of the civil servants. We've had about three iterations of the Pebec Awards and we had a big Pebec at Five event last December. So it's also carrot and stick and trying to, though we do have challenges with consequence management sometimes, but we also try to reward them. Next slide, please. Just to talk about our partnerships, there you see Bangwa and Igodalo, I wasn't exaggerating. Um, we've worked with private sector, KPMG, embedded uh, consultant uh, with us from inception for about three years also. Deloitte embedded two people, P&G, Alucano Ebody for about a year, ratio consult. So we've had uh, in-house support in the team. We've also had external communication. We've worked with development partners like the World Bank, like the British government, and that has also helped us with implementing the ideation in a very innovative manner. Next slide, please. We've had sort of, uh, for strategic communications, we had a pool, like some banks came together and pooled money and, and uh, uh, procured strategic partnership advertising on our behalf. So no money came to government. They just wanted to support some of the work that we were doing. So they pulled this fund together and that helped a bit with our communication. But it's also very difficult just speaking to, to communication. Sometimes it's drowned out in all the noise of everything happening, but it's at least one bright light. We had support from, from um, one of the organized private sector also with the report gov.ng. Next slide, please. So this is the team. The composition of the team is unique. A lot of young Nigerians, mostly under 35 from all across the country, all sorts of educational backgrounds. We have civil servants in the team from the Lead P. That's a high performing um, program for those on a, on a fast track, really well-trained civil servants. We have a number of them uh, on our team. We also have uh, staff at our Office of the Accountant General. We have a whole team. From the, from the civil service, handing our financials and our procurement. And then you have young Nigerians, you wouldn't even know who's a copper, who isn't, uh, all sorts of backgrounds, doing great things at the public secretariat. Next slide, please. So this is a, a retreat we had earlier this year. Those are the reform champions from all the state governments that could attend. And it just goes to show that we don't just work in a silo at the federal government, 
We work with state governments, we work with judiciaries at state level. We work very closely with the National Assembly, as I said earlier. So these are some of the partnerships. And NESG is also a very, very um, close partner of the PEPEC Secretariat. Next slide, please. So we were approached uh, by MIT a couple of months ago now, earlier this year, um, identified as a reform champion, identified for innovation, for the work that we do and how we've done it. And um, that really felt good, apart from World Bank and, and some of the accolades we've had there, it's not so much about um, the sort of fanfare, but when a, a very serious academic institution wants to work on with you, partner with you and look at what you've done and how you've done it and recognizing the innovation in public sector space. This is a program they have around the world and they're looking at Nigeria and they're looking at the public sector specifically. And, and the, we have a fellow coming in for four months He's coming in uh, at the beginning of September and he'll be with us till the end of the year. So what we have said we want to do with the MIT collaboration is to deepen our work on executive order one. There was a lot of political capital from His Excellency the Vice President that went into signing that. And for a lot of reasons that Mr. Igudalo spoke about, you don't always get out of, or out of the policy space what you put into it, which is probably one of the most important um, things I'd like to, to leave you with as, as fellows, that that doesn't mean you stop putting in your best. Next slide, please. Just to end on that, it's, it's a, we need to institutionalize reforms. We need to, it's all about collaboration and it's a journey of continuous improvement. In the larger context and, and what he spoke about, it's about commitment to nation building and nobody will build Nigeria for us. If we're committed to Nigeria and committed to this kind of work, public policy, and implementing the policies that we uh, ideate and research on and create, then we need to find ways to collaborate. I was quite amused by the, by the inductee talking about corruption free. And I was gladdened when Mr. Igudalo talked about rolling up your sleeves. I mean, nobody is gonna promise you that it's going to be easy working in public sector or working with public sector or researching on public sector and policy space in Nigeria, but you can make impact. Maybe we've worked much harder than we needed to, to get, you know, maybe we put in 100% to get 10%, but we don't regret any of it. It's very gratifying when you meet MSMEs who are our clients and we are public servants in the true sense of the word, we're here to serve them. And they recognize and they acknowledge that our work has made a difference to their businesses. So in the larger scheme of things, I'll just wrap up by saying that, yes, we're probably an oasis of sanity, uh, but the idea is to speak to inductees like you and to charge you as you go ahead into this work. Some of you I already know, like Wilson, and has already been doing good work. Uh, you know what it takes, and we fully expect you to do what it takes to make an impact in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, ma'am. Um, thank you for really taking the time to walk us through. I think I was really blown away by all of the work, you know, gone going at Pepex. So thank you for taking the time to walk us through that and also showcasing or explaining to us how collaboration can work, providing practical examples around that. Um, we do have questions, but I have a special request, uh, and I don't know if you would oblige, um, that we take Mrs. Abubakar and then come back for questions. Oh, certainly. That's my big <laughs> sis, certainly. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Amaka, you're on mute. Oh, I'm You're, You're mute again. Oh my goodness, what's going on? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I was suggesting that our distinguished fellows share their questions so that we collate them. And then after our next hmm. speaker, Mr. Bubakar, we can take all the questions at once. Thank you very much again, Dr. Goli. Um, I will quickly introduce our next speaker. 
who feels like a family member. Um, Mrs. Abubakar is a passionate and intentional individual with over three decades of professional experience covering public service administration, pension, investment banking, SME finance, and rural enterprise development, and microcredit administration, international development, and human resources management. Um, her work has focused primarily or principally on small and micro enterprise development, women development, and family livelihood enhancement. Her gentle but firm man has allowed the fostering of a strong network and relationship locally and internationally. In 2005, she joined the Abuja Enterprise Agency as the office manager and rose through the ranks to become the managing director CEO um, in 2015 due to high display of management, uh, management acumen, hard work, dedication, resilience, and ruggedness against all odds. Her commitment to excellence and dedication saw AEA, which is the Abuja Enterprise Agency, through to receive the Global Citizen Movement Award for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and Leadership in 2013 in New York um, for being a model for entrepreneurial development as a way to lift people and communities out of extreme poverty and serving as a model for the rest of the world. Due to her excellent performance at the AEA and desire for challenge, she left the agency to become a pioneer director of the Pension Transitional Arrangement Directorate, seen to the welfare of pensioners under the Customs, Immigration, and Pensions Department. She had only been in PTAD for a few months when His Excellency President Mohammed Buhari appointed her as the Federal Minister um, for the Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Investment in November 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me. I could go on and on reading her bio, but please join me in welcoming Mrs. Aisha Abubakar. Good afternoon, ma'am. If you can hear me, you have the floor. Can anyone hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. And here. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. So I think Mrs. Abubakar's internet. Um, Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you very much. Can you all hear Yes, we can, but it's dragging a bit. So maybe you can just turn off your video. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you, but it's dragging. So it's a little difficult to follow. But if you turn off your video, I think that bandwidth would be better. Okay, so um, since we have lost Mrs. Aisha Abubakar, I think we can just take a few questions pending when she, she gets back on the call and we can um, listen to her make her address. Okay, so I have- Mrs. Abubakar is joining back on. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. We can see you, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. We can hear you. Yes. I don't know what happened, but then this is technology. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, our dear fellows, my sister Nike and um, Amaka. Keep the flag flying. I don't know if I can be as eloquent as my other sister, um, Dr. Jumoke, but I'll give it a try. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. We can. Okay. So I'm delighted to be here to present this address at the maiden induction ceremony of the Fate Institute Fellows Program, pioneered by Fate Foundation. First, let me congratulate. Um,
sorry. Let me congratulate um, the Faith Foundation for being proactive in the setup of the Faith Institute Fellows Program which I understand is a two-year fellowship program aimed at bringing together policy experts, economics, and academia to support the policy design, review, and implementation processes that will address key gaps, limiting the potential of the Nigerian entrepreneurship ecosystem. The Faith Institution is the research policy and advocacy arm of the Faith Foundation that leads to innovative thinking and creates platforms to enable idea exchange and problem-solving strategies to foster sustainable entrepreneurship in Nigeria. I therefore congratulate the six pioneer fellows being inducted today into the Institute. And I think I know one of them, Dr. Rilwanu Adirito. We've had an opportunity to interact in the past, I think when I was in AEA. So when given the topic, developing data insights to drive effective decision-making and institutional change, my initial response was, what do I know about data insights? But after some reflection, I realized that the chosen stick of today is apt as it communicates the challenge we face due to ineffective data collation, as well as the inefficient use of data analysis, of data analysis. And I've always said, what cannot be measured cannot be useful. data, we know facts and figures, facts and statistics collected for reference or analysis, making a basis for reasoning or calculation. Then data insights refers to the deep in understanding an individual organization gains from an analyzing information. Data insights allows us to better understand business and optimize it based on analysis. So insights are the takeaways we garner from the analysis, which should help us form an accurate understanding of the situation. Data-driven decision-making is the process of using data to inform your decision. So what data and insights are useful for decision-making in the public sector? Globally, we know private and public sectors have now embraced a variety of tools to facilitate decision-making. Most public sector data are based on personalities, people, places, businesses, locations, demography, and so on, usually collected through census, and administrative records. Decision-making is the act of deciding the best choice or alternative that brings success or advantage to a situation that will ensure maximum benefits and the least risk, especially in the public sector. Efficient use of data can improve the design efficiency and outcomes of services provided by the public sector. This should offer a lot of advantages such as greater accountability and transparency, faster decision-making processes, continuous improvement, innovation, efficient and effective use of resources, learnings and unlearnings. Um, this is critical in the public sector because the public sector policies influence all spheres of life, be it education, social economics, health, laws, or rendering essential services such as transportation, primary health care, security, that ensure the normal function of society. As such, data-driven decision-making promotes good governance, which leads to an equitable society. The federal government of Nigeria has invested in data-driven technologies such as IPs, which is the payment of government salaries, civil servant salaries, it's a platform. Remita, a platform where all utilities are paid into the government accounts. GIFMIS, which is the international standard of an accounting, accounting standards for all MDAs. BVN, we know now we all have to have a BVN number. We all also have to have a NIN, national identity number. Uh, and there's a lot of ongoing, there are a lot of initiatives trying to link your BVN, your NIN, your e-passport, your telephone number, all of this just as a way of data collection for better planning in the future. We've recently had the introduction of the eNaira. Um, state peer review, which is something my sister has alluded to when she was speaking. Um, states are now uh, giving platforms to compete in terms of uh, providing the essentials, uh, basic essentials for their for their gov uh, for their society for their people. Pebec, you know, she's mentioned it. So at Pebec or at the national at the national governance forum, you know, we have this state peer review where states that are performing in terms of providing essential services to their people are, 
are graded high, those who are not doing anything. So you can we know that some states will say salaries are not being paid. Some states will say salaries have been paid. Some states have said rural roads are being created and so on. So these are some of the some of the data platforms that federal government have instilled to be able to inform decision making. There are also some government agencies that are starting with a specific task of this data collection, the National Population Commission. And I understand we have a census coming up. A census, essence of census is to know exactly how many we are, better planning, where we need more roads, where we need more education, I mean schools, where we would have um, you know, demography, dense populations, electric, electrification, and so on and so forth. National Bureau of Statistics, NITDA, Smedan, to name a few. Smedan, of course, um, Faith Foundation we're very familiar with. And for me, being very passionate about entrepreneurship, I still believe that a lot of um, analysis, data analysis has to go into the figures that we have. If we have over 30 something number of SMEs, where are they, what are they doing? Um, what access do they have? What demographies do they have? How can we cater for them? How many of them have access finance? What have they done with the finance? What? So that's a whole lot, but that's not my topic. So I will not, I will not dwell on it. Um, others not so specifically are critical. So others not so specifically, but are also critical for planning include all federal government owned hospitals. When you go to a hospital, you have a record. Um, we can find out how many times you go to the hospital, we can find out what your major issues are, how often you come, and planning can be done around the schools, police, prisons, and so on. So for instance, a decision to allocate more funds for the construction of more schools or hospitals, vis-a-vis -vis to re renovate or upgrade existing ones, conversion of government-owned buildings to entrepreneurial centers, be better debated based on data, the maximum utilization for the betterment of society or immediate environment. So there are some decisions that can be better guided by data insights that analyzes the impact of each project, thus giving policymakers the right information to prioritize in view of the scarcity of resources. In the public sector, the use of data such as population, distribution, economic performance, demographies, geographic information, gender, poverty level, macroeconomic information is crucial in designing economic policy programs, deploying resources and generating data insights, not just on GDP per capita income, but also literacy levels, employment levels, and so on. So, I mean, you know, in Nigeria, and we've had passionate speakers, Dr. Mr. Dr. Egalu, Dr. Jumoke, um, we're all very passionate about Nigeria. None of us would want to leave this country for anything. And I know that, and I can say that without even asking them. Um, so we know that our people are the best in everything that we do. So for us to be able to be, so we, we do have people who can use this data. And I'm particularly talking about the civil servants at this time. They are well educated, they are well equipped, and they are well prepared to use this data for the benefit of the greater good, which is the society at large. But um, there are certain things that just need to be done. And I'll get that, I'll get into that when I talk about the engagement part of it. So data and insight generation generated are used in guiding the decisions making processes in the public sector. And these decisions have far reaching impact requiring less reliance on human intuition but evolving a scientific approach that is guided by data, not impulse. Data-driven decisions is ingrained in the public sector towards creating a more inclusive society where everyone feels the impact of good governance. So how do we get data into the hands of the right stakeholders? Um, speaking for experience, I would say engagement. Um, if, we, if we have to use, um, the data that we have in the most efficient and resourceful manner, we would have to continuously engage from inception. So data-driven decision-making system provides an interesting opportunity for the public sector to improve service delivery. That's a given. The impact of data insight can only be felt if they are delivered to the right stakeholders, which underscores the need for, the, for more public-private dialogues. 
which is why I'm very happy the Faith Foundation has been proactive in setting up of the Institute, where we hope that a lot of their findings can be used to guide public sector decision making. Um, research is an area where government is not very strong, and I'm hoping that this will be a good platform for partnership between the Faith Institute and the public sector. Um, so we have to um, bring on trade associations, pressure groups, international donors, and relevant public sector institutions. This will create the needed cooperation amongst the public and private sector. It offers benefits to both parties, such as cooperation, enhanced capacity of operators, which is, uh, which is crucial to building a structure for. And you know, this, this data has to be tested, it has to be right, it has to be fit for purpose. And these are not things that federal government can do on their own. They would need the support from the private sector for them to be able to continuously do these testings, go through the processes and, and go back. So you're not just doing the one time, we have to keep doing it on a continuous, um, on, on a continuous basis. So what is the best form of, uh, for, what is the best form of format to share or present data to the public sector? Um, um, Dr. Jumake has alluded what they do on Payback, getting all the other states involved, um, engagement, you know, federal government has used different platforms, um, town hall meetings, um, you know, record scorecards, and so on, just to be able to, to engage. And there are also various platforms, you know, we have the MSME, SM, MSME Council, we have the Council of Industry, Trade and Investment, um, so all these are being led by the federal ministries across all the ministries across the 36 states of the Federation, um, just for engagement. And each state is supposed to carry on the message on, on that. So if I have to be very specific, a lot of these councils just have the policy element, which is the intention federal government wants to do. And federal government wants the subnationals to key into it. But when it comes to actually do the implementation process, which is where I think the institute would come into play, as well as other state, other private sector stakeholders. Um, so if we have to do a case study again, um, one experience that comes to my mind is the co-creation of, co of data insights between stakeholders, the collaboration we had with Ernest Young through the PDF and the Foreign Ministry of Industry Trade and Investment. Um, as I alluded, as I said earlier, you know, I was very concerned about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we got the buy-in of international donors and partnered with Ernest Young, and we brought in Smedan to own the process. And so and that's another key factor. You always have to bring in the public sector to own the process, otherwise it will be frustrated halfway and you, you won't be able to move further on that. So one of the outcomes of that was the review and the classification of the nano category. And I'm very happy to hear that, um, it has also been mentioned. I, I hadn't even realized that it had gone this far, but yes, the nano category in the strata of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. We presented this data at the um, council on MSME where it was adopted. And so we organized a validation exercise where all stakeholders adopted it. So I'm happy to say that due to the robust process we engaged, the new classification proposal of the nano category was adopted. It has become a policy. This was adopted in the 2021. Um, SMED and in the beginning were very resistant, you know, and um, they kept saying there was no nano category, there was no this, there was no that, but I'm glad that this has happened and we can see the difference it's making for the entrepreneurship um, sectors. So, um, Ladies and gentlemen, fellows, um, panel, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, the world of data does offer a lot of opportunities. Building a data-driven decision-making system is crucial to enhancing our well-being as a nation. Um, we must take hold of this opportunity provided by the fellows program and build a data system that will provide policymakers and the public data insights that will address the multi-sectoral challenges we are facing. I mean, to make Nigeria a truly inclusive society, we must imbibe data driven by, the, uh, driven by the private sector. I strongly believe because they have the resources, they have the time, and they also will benefit, are the greatest beneficiaries of the outcomes of, of all of this. So we must really use data insights with the economic growth of our country. The fellows have a lot of work ahead of them to utilize the research, to design policies, 
the appropriate implementation processes that will change the narrative. But then again, whatever you're doing, no matter how frustrating it is, you must always carry the public sector. You must always find platforms to engage the public. Whether you're, even if you just have to submit reports to them on, an, on, on a regular basis, let them be aware of what you're doing. And, and that way they will begin to key into what, um, what the private sector has to offer. Because truly the development of Nigeria cannot come from the public sector. It has to be from the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I, I thought that this was this was really amazing. Thank you for sharing um, and speaking directly to the topic, uh, um, which really was really developing data insights to drive effective decision making and institutional change. Um, I think that you you sort of touched on every aspect of it. So and you did that really beautifully, weaving all of the different aspects and components together. You talked on the importance of data and how it guides effective decision making. And also talked around being able to achieve institutional change through collaboration. So thank you very much, ma'am, for sharing those key insights and for providing guidance to our fellows. Um, at this juncture, we're going to open up the floor to take questions. Um, questions directed at Dr. Utuwale and questions directed at our Final speaker, Mrs. Abubakar. Um, the first hand I have up is Wilson Erimebo. Wilson, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'd say thank you to my chairman, Mr. Haswe Godalo, you know, um, for your thought-provoking um, insights. And also to um, Dr. Uh, Jumake Oduwale, my, my, I mean, I, I think uh, Pebec is one of the most um, laudable initiatives of this administration, um, especially given some of the works they've done with Kama, with the, uh, you know, through NASBAR and so many other partnerships they've had. Um, I would like to know um, if there has been any sort of like an impact assessment, especially on the macros, you know, maybe in relation to employment, um, you know, growth of small businesses, expansion of small businesses, especially given that um, we have lots of informal uh, businesses, you know, operating in the country. Um, the other quite brief question is on access to markets. And uh, this is one area where I'll be working on. And I'd like to know if um, what work is being done in terms of the e export, um, you know, uh, simplifying the export processes for small businesses, because this has been, you know, uh, a longstanding problems for SMEs and also in the area of coordination of government agencies, because uh, like we know, it seems, you know, some government agencies, maybe by nature of how they are structured or, or maybe closeness to the presidency, it's quite difficult to work with those agencies. I mean, customs is a clear example, and I'm sure uh, Madam Minister would, would uh, maybe perhaps can also share more light on that. How easy um, is it to work with these agencies and how can we ensure that collaboration, you know, going forward? Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take the second question from Rowan and then would uh, proceed to answer it. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start by acknowledging the speakers. I'm quite uh, uh, delighted to have listened to Mr. Godalo on the wonderful presentation. And um, I also thank Dr. Duwali for that uh, uh, beautiful presentation. I am mean, indeed glad to hear that our government has been doing a lot uh, in terms of addressing the, the business environment in Nigeria. Um, also, I'm happy to have met my Adia here, <laughs> Mrs. Abubaka, thanks so much for being there over the years. I have two questions, one for Dr. Uh, Oduwale. Yes, these are great works that have been done by you. What are the key challenges that you have encountered in doing this job? And how have you been able to overcome them? I'm concerned about knowing the challenges because uh, working from within, uh, so I would say you have this to be initiative from a private sector or public, other other members of the public 
perhaps um, uh, there could be more challenges, but let's no, probably draw a lot of lessons from that. Thank you. Is for Mr. I was fortunate to be part of the Growth and Employment Project of the Federal Ministry of uh, Industries, Trade and Investment. And I will say with a high level of responsibility that that was a great uh, approach to the support of entrepreneurship uh, in Nigeria because it was a full-fledged kind of process. I was engaged in the part of uh, uh, support to small and medium enterprises in terms of coaching and holding uh, to the point of uh, their business grant proposal. Uh, my question is, uh, Perhaps close to the end of the tenure of that uh, project in collaboration with the World Bank, we, we read that we couldn't really achieve like a, a higher percentage of the fund available, meaning that access to that fund was hindered one way or the other. What could have been responsible for, for this, that we are unable to fully exploit the opportunities for supporting our small land? medium enterprises through such a wonderful project that we that we uh, that you had in the ministry. So what are the obstacles? Why would didn't we have up to 70, 80 percent of uh, access to that fund? Uh, thank you very much once again for your beautiful renditions and we are happy uh, to have you behind us now. We know all the speakers are behind us in this uh, journey and we continuously uh, reach out to you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adirito. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, we have one more from Omar Shalawa, and then proceed to answer. Good morning. Oh, sorry, it is afternoon. Um, <laughs> thank you very much again to uh, the speakers. Um, I don't know which of you in particular can answer this question because my question is kind of a tie between both. But thank you very much, Dr. Odwali, for what you're doing. Um, it's great to see um, a project that is carrying the states along. So um, there's actually more hope of um, implementation. However, my question is, and this, this has to do with... with um, what uh, Mrs. Abubakar had said towards the end where she said um, a lot of the development is going to come from the private sector. And my, my issue with it is tying that to policy in a country where um, policies can happen in the blink of an eye that would just change the structure of a person's business. How do we expect the development to come from the private sector when you know things like like for example um, a state waking up and saying there's a statewide overnight okada ban and then everyone who has just imported okadas that they needed for their business is suddenly at a fix how do you encourage the private sector to take that risk knowing fully well that or or, or things like with exports the policies on exports can change in like two seconds. And so how do you, we had had a talk um, a few weeks ago from somebody who had, and I remember that very well, who had talked about a friend who bought a yam farm and the next thing he couldn't do anything with it. So when policies can change in the blink of an eye, how do you encourage the private sector to keep working towards development when it seems like things are just being frustrated from the top? Thank you. Should I respond? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, I <clears throat> I understand your frustration, and um, I I I know where you're coming from, but um, in sincerity, you know we have to start doing things the right way. The federal government has a set of policies or have a sense of direction of where they're going. I think it is up to the private sector to also come and say, okay, 
let's come to the table and we would do A, B, C if you would stop this and this with a timeline and see how it goes. So if, for example, you say I have a policy on YAM and I, I'm going to get all my farmers associations, I'm going to get all the banks, I'm going to get to invest in YAM farming for a period of three years. And these are the outcomes that are going to be, these are the outcomes we expect. I don't think federal government will say to you, oh no, we'll, we'll wake up and change the policy the following day because they know the benefit of the greater good, which means it's going to create employment, it's going to put food, uh, put food on the table, um, income will be generated, you know? But if there's no collaboration, which is why I keep saying that you ha there has to be a continuous engagement. There has to be a continuous engagement. And the private sector, if you are also strong enough, you know, you can also come to the federal government and say, we do not agree with, and you see the likes of Nasima and Nasi, and sometimes, you know, opposing the policies of the CBN or policies that have come out. You just have to make your voice known and heard and then come to the negotiating table. You don't say no and sit where you are. You come and say, this is what we want and this is what we can do. And we know we can do it. Give us this timeline. I think that for me, that would be um, my solution. But we cannot continue to just say, federal government policy, policy somersaults have always been part of government because they're trying to make everything work. But private sector understands that you cannot make everything work at the same time. I think we lost okay. You know, she's saying that um, MSMEs may not have that influence. But you do have associations like MAN, the SEMA, who all have MSMEs. All these are, are your voices, you know, and you also have an apex agency that should work for you, not the other way around, SMEDEN. You also have an MSME council where you can send your petitions and your letters to where you will be heard. So there are various ways you can put your I'm not saying they'll be responded to immediately, but at least, you know, the effort is being made and whatever you're requesting for is being recorded one place or the other. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that response. Um, I will now call on Dr. Oduwale uh, to respond. Dr. Oduwale, you, you may want to take the same question and then respond to the earlier ones that were directed at you. Um, I know we had one from Wilson. Wilson sort of talked around measuring impact on MSMEs, um, and impact on micro, macro, really. He talked about that and then impact on MSMEs. He's also talked about access to markets. So he wanted to hear a bit more from you around that. Um, for real one, so my internet unfortunately froze for a bit, but I think what he was trying to find out was lessons. So key lessons that we can you know, learn, especially for fellows um, from your experience working at Quebec. And then he also talked around access to funds for MSMEs and he cited a specific program. Um, again, I lost out on that information, but he mentioned a specific program that he wanted feedback on. So those were the thoughts that and I that question was for um, That question was for Haji Abubakar actually. On the GEMS project. Was that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I actually Dr. missed out on that. Man. Apologies. Sorry, Amaka, I'm talking over you. Um, Dr. Oduwale, no one wanted to know your challenge. Yeah, yeah, I got the questions. I got the questions. Oh, okay. I had all the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hadja, do you want to answer about GEM? Okay. <clears throat> so the GEM program eventually um, was shut down by the World Bank because, you know, the World Bank, when they partner with federal government is time bound. And when it is time bound, they also have to report back to their headquarters. So after the circle, it was extended for some time and then extended for a second time. And eventually it had to be, it had to be folded up. So that's why the funds um, were not made available to all the beneficiaries at the end. Um, there were so many challenges in the ministry in trying to implement that particular program. 
that caused a lot of delays. Um, so unfortunately, the World Bank had to just um, shut it down eventually. Thank you. Okay, Wilson, thank you for the question. So we've had two empirical impact assessments based on our own work. So we had one in 2018 that was done by financial derivatives. We actually did that for us pro bono, um, Mr. Bismarck Rewani. So they just looked at the, the reforms we had done, I think about 140 at the time and how impactful they were to MSMEs around the country. And then we commissioned the second one last year when PEBEC turned five and KPMG implemented that. So we have a five-year empirical impact assessment uh, that was released last year in 2021. In that second impact assessment, we tried to see whether there was any correlation right up to GDP, right up to all the, all the macro indicators. Um, it, it's kind of tough to empirically trace, but we saw some, some um, I won't say as, as strong as correlations, but some patterns and trends that can be further, further traced and developed. So about access to markets and competitiveness for MSMEs, especially now with AFCFTA, um, with exports, it's an area that we continue to work on. We've had uh, all through from 2016, trying to work on port reforms, trying to make sure that there's a single window, a national single window put in place, trying to make sure that we have scanners and a ports community. So these are all automation projects and infrastructure projects but have a lot to do with people and processes. So the whole gamut of, of the work that we do at PEBEC has been extremely challenging. Um, some of the work in terms of implementation of the, of the trade facilitation agreement and standards are under the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, but the, the core that I just described, that work that PEBEC had been trying to do since 2016 and, and without as much success as we'd like. There are a lot of entrenched interests in that area and it just didn't move. And this is right across all uh, arms and levels of government. Um, how do we handle recalcitrant MDAs or MDAs that are sort of have direct access to power? There's a challenge with, with consequence management. So there, there are a number of, of factors at play. So sometimes you have it working in your favor. If you have a reform-minded head of agency that is particularly close to power, let's say an influential MDA that is also reform-minded, then you get a lot done. If you have an influential MDA that is not sort of interested in reforming and not paying attention to the reform agenda, then they really can um, derail and undermine the work that you do. That's just the, the luck of the draw. And you have to continue trying to do your work. You don't stop. You just keep, keep on keeping on. Like with the ports reforms that I've described, there's really no time I make a major presentation that I still don't speak about the ports reforms that are re required for Nigeria and the reasons why. Uh, Will one asked about key challenges. I'll, I'll say that in a nutshell, those are the same key challenges. Um, being able to ensure full implementation of the work you do, um, they're not having the opportunity to have direct consequence management on MDAs. I said we track about 55 of them. We partner quite closely with the head of service and she and the permanent secretaries have more impact on the public and civil servants and also the OSGF and probably even, even some of the ministers in terms of the way uh, the public service and the civil service works. So that affects your ability to deliver on particular reforms, but that's what also uh, makes it as a matter of, of urgency to learn how to network, to learn how to collaborate in areas where we've lost out in terms of collaboration and being able to deliver. We've made significant gains we had a big lesson with Kama. We had a, a setback for about 15 months. We didn't give up. We continued to pursue the, the relevant stakeholders till we got to the end. The omnibus bill also before the National Assembly took a Herculean amount. Um, even the, the World Bank program um, that were, that's coming on board for 750 million for three years has taken a significant, and it's not over yet. So there, there are a lot of 
issues, even when we go to state governors, when we go to national assembly, when we go to the, fed, the federal government, it's the nature of the beast, it's the nature of the work and, and we're here for it. It's, reform work takes a lot of courage. It takes, you have to, you take the knocks, there's frustrations, but you have to encourage yourself and be naturally optimistic because you know what's at stake for the country. And you know that if you don't do it, nobody else will do it. So I'm answering uh, Shaliwa's question uh, because this is the, the sort of second question that has come with a tinge of how, how do we then live? So if we, if we don't believe that we can really take the bull by the horns with a lot of courage and jump into the arena, then, then we will not succeed. It's just a very demanding and rugged reform area. So, so it's, it's really fortune favors the brave and the bold. Any, any impact that Pebec has made in the last six years is as a result of uh, the political backing and the support of, of people that I've spoken about, both within government and outside government, across arms and levels of government. But you earn that credibility, you earn the trust by really focusing. So private sector, um, we've been able to deliver things for private sector that they've, they've we've, we've, we've reversed policy flip-flops. So if somebody somewhere in some MDA comes up with, with a, for example, I remember when standards organization came up with what effectively was a new tax. It was something called PAM that was going to be a sticker on every product, a 15 hour sticker on every product, whether it's one item or a box of items, I was going to significantly increase the cost of goods. Uh, Haji Abubakar will remember that it was announced and it, were, it was going ahead. They had gone on a field trip to, to Kenya and back. And I said, you know, this thing, because stakeholders were up in arms, I said, this is effectively a tax and it's not going to be good for the sector. What Sun needs to do is to focus on, on the Sun cap and man cap and get that done and get that efficient, automate that. You have your pre-inspection agencies, make sure they do what they're meant to do. You cannot, have not been able to do what you are empowered to do by legislation. You can't now bring yet another regulatory cost constraint. I spoke earlier about the cost of compliance. So you hear about the negative sound bites of, of policy flip-flops that have a nerd, but I will tell you that private sector can also point to policy flip-flops that have flipped back again because people have stood up to them. Having said that, the real crux of the matter is making sure that there are people within the public service who are, are willing to stand by quality policy reforms and do the necessary work and engage people. Like was just said by, by Hadja, that you, you don't give up, you stay there and, and with tenacity and you fight for what you want as a sector, you get organized, there's no free lunch. And this is what happens around the world. The power of collective bargaining and the power of tenacity and making your voice heard. You partner with media, you find uh, friendly champions within government and you push your agenda for your sector. But private sector also has a responsibility to be pretty well informed. So that's another thing that, that with private sector, especially with MSMEs, it, it's amazing how some MSMEs are going into a business, into a sector without even knowing the regulatory landscape at all. So they just have an idea and start a business, you know, incorporate a company and start a business. And then there are regulatory hurdles and landscapes that they didn't foresee or didn't understand. And then they get stuck, but they were always there. So having uh, knowledge and being aware is also the responsibility of private sector. So all in all, because this is a policy discussion, it's, it's very interesting work, but it does take a high level of tenacity. If, if, if we think that the problems are, are insurmountable, then they will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Odewale. I have some questions in the Q&A, um, but I will just, I will just read out now. Um, and they're all, they're all directed at you, actually. Um, so the first one is from Samaila Ba, and he says, I must commend, he or she, my apologies, says, I must commend the work of PEBEC in improving the economic environment for businesses. My question is, what are the strategies the government intends to use in curbing corruption in the MDAs? And, and are there protection, or is there protection for whistleblowers? So that's one. So do I take, take all the questions or? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next question from Ade Kunle Ulishile says, how can I access the Quebec reports? So I think we'll probably look for the link for that and share. Um, and then Ibrahim Mohammed Shagadi says, I hope this would not end with this administration. So all the good work that we have seen happen and uh, take place at Quebec, hopefully it doesn't end with this administration. So this person just wants some reassurance around that. Um, Nuruddin Mukta says, seems to be talking more around publicity and awareness of the work that Pebec is doing. Um, and then there's an anonymous attendee who is saying the same thing, saying, wow, this is brilliant work. We don't seem to be hearing you know, a, lot of, a lot of this. Um, the next question is, says something around, Okay, so again, building on the previous question, but this person is saying, how, how is Pebec looking to ensure continuity um, of the work that has taken place within the organization, especially in view of transition that is coming, uh, that is coming on? Okay, so that, that's it, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for the, these are really great questions. Samaila. Um, strategies for curbing corruption. So the executive order one, the way the executive order is designed was to address two things. So the main things that we, we found from engaging private sector, corruption and bureaucracy. So the, the time to do things and then the opaqueness of not knowing What's the list of requirements? What time? Every time there's a human interface, there's opportunity, potential opportunity for corruption. Not always, because we make very helpful and good public and civil servants, but the perception and the opportunity is there for, for any public servant who wants to be a corrupt actor. So we, we, we focus on layering automation and removing that human contact, that human interface. So whether it's at the airports, at the seaports, Corporate Affairs Commission, Immigration, um, Customs, whichever the agency, the reforms are focused on three broad areas. We're working on people issues, processes, and infrastructure. We're also working on the cost and the time and the transparency of implementing the reforms. So those are basically, in a nutshell, the strategies that we deploy um, for that. Protection of whistleblowers. So the report.gov.ng is not a whistleblower app. The MDA has to put their name and the information so we can verify because we also don't want a situation where people are just venting or, or trying to, to um, frame, for lack of a better word, a ministry department or agency. There needs to be fair, fair hearing. So we want the data and the information so that we can look into it. And that is exactly what the team does. Having said that, We've had whistleblower petitions to the vice president, to our office. We've even shared them. In fact, they, they were not even whistleblower because people put their names on it. Sometimes they put it in the, in the public domain, in the media. Sometimes you have public servants making a petition on maybe their superiors, their director. There's one that is really quite raging right now. And so we work on those. We really, we have investigation. We are the ones that, that work um, sort of get, not whistleblowers, but we get people to just go and, and um, afresh without knowing, you just get people to infiltrate and get a triangulation of information to be able to decipher what exactly is going on. And we also work with other agencies like ICPC, um, like the office of the, of the head of service to try and drill down. Now, Ade Kunle, uh, businessmadeeasy.ng, and I'm sure someone will share the, the link. All our reports are, are publicly available. Ibrahim, sustainability is probably one of the biggest challenges. We got that question so much at the end of the first administration, so we took it very seriously from 2019 to date. First of all, the team has not only uh, consultants from private sector, but also consultants from the public sector working in our technical team, like I said. So it's a, it's a public private team in the true sense of the word. And we have people that have never even worked anywhere. We have people that we took in from, from National Youth Service and fresh graduates. So this is their first uh, working experience and it's been a very pleasant one according to them. 
although very challenging. So the, the sustainability question is about having people that are committed to the to the to doing the work. That's the bottom up approach, having people that want to work on a team and on a project like this. From the top uh, down approach, it's hard to commit uh, a future administration. I wouldn't comment, although I am very political, I wouldn't comment here in a policy discussion on who would win the elections and whether or not. But I must say that for this particular intervention, we have no fears whatsoever because we are non-political in the sense that we work with every governor. We work with the national, we're not even, I mean, governors tease me that she, she's not, you know, it's not even about politics. If a governor is doing well, I'm the first to say it. And if a governor is not doing well, by the time we name the ones that are doing well, it becomes apparent. So whether it's APC, PDP, APCA, whoever, we work very well with colleagues. You saw the, the photographs. We just had a neck approval last Thursday. Um, so, so NGF, we're, we're very regular there. And so the, the work, it, it, what, what, I, what we always say is that it's one economy and it's Team Nigeria. So that's how we look at it. And we know that whatever um, administration comes in next, we'll confidently make a presentation during the handover period that this is us, this is all what we've done. Whatever you want to do with it, these are people that can go forward. I'm a political appointee, but my team are technical, they're sound, and they're ready to do the work, very committed to Nigeria. Um, Noor Adin talked about strategic communication. It's one of our biggest challenges, which is why we, we do accept invitations like this to speak. And I'm always amazed, although we speak so often, and it's even, it's even challenging because of the workload. It, still, we meet people all the time that don't know anything. But that, again, is the nature of government. It's a big country. And, and what is disproportionately amplified is the negative news. It's a global phenomenon and it's, uh, Nigeria is not exempt. So you wouldn't find many features. And that's why I said that some banks and some companies had to come together put, to put a strategic comms uh, fund for us together at the last of, um, end of the administration. But now we're in a better place in terms of that with, with budgeting. I didn't talk about internal challenges like getting funded and getting you know, kitted as a team. Uh, but yes, strategic communication is a big one. So please do help us amplify our message. Um, and that's basically it. I think that is the last question. For continuity, yes, I think I think it's a wrap. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, wow, this has been, been a really, really interesting session. If I can just make in one more question. So I have somebody asking how they can work with Pebe. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is we've no, actually- working, getting a job, but maybe collaborating yeah. or something. Yes, no, we've, we've had both. We've had, we've had people very tenacious, especially younger ones that have pursued us for months and actually gotten on the team. We've had interns, we've had volunteers and, and collaboration. We've, we've collaborated with several, we've collaborated with individuals, we've collaborated with organized private sector, with individual companies as well. And, and people that are just passionate about Nigeria and about the mandate. So sending in ideas, having brainstorming sessions, there are a lot of ways to collaborate with, with the Pepec Secretariat. Okay, thank you very much. So I would suggest that you visit the website, peruse the website and send an email, you know, to explore options in that regard. Thank you very much, Dr. Duwale. Really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, I mean, we've gone way over the time we thought <laughs> would be appropriate, <laughs> but this has really been an engaging, enlightening session. And we're glad that we, you know, we, we took all of the comments, we took all the questions, and we're able to listen to our speakers. Um, so very quickly, we have two of our fellows who will be speaking um, and just, you know, sharing thanks on behalf of the fellows. So I'll quickly call on Omar Shalewa. Um, and then shortly after, we'll have Wilson also speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amaka. Um, thank you so much to the Faith Foundation. I know that it's going to be a great two-year journey. Forgive my background for you. Um, my twins are four today, and they really want all the snuggles, so I'm sorry. And it's still morning here. But thank you so much. Um, thank you to our speakers today, Mr. Ekodalo. Thank you so much for such an enlightening um, keynote speech. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Duale, for 
like basically introducing Pepec to some of us because some of us had no clue. And I know that's embarrassing to say because if MIT is noticing, what's our excuse? Um, <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much. Um, to Haji Abubakar, we're very grateful. Um, thank you for making us to see the work that the federal government is doing and how it would help our research. Um, thank you, at least, it's great for me to, to, to put faces to names that I have probably read a, a few things about in the past. And so um, if you see us sending you emails saying things like, please, I need data, please understand that. Uh, we can refer to today and say, we met you on Soso -so Day, but thank you, thank you, thank you very much for taking out the time, the foundation. Thank you for all the um, great speakers that you've given us over the past one month. It's been, it's been great. My, my notepad is full and so we're very grateful and we hope that we're able to translate that into great research that would make a huge difference, at least we hope, um, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Nigeria. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mwashalawa. Um, Wilson, you're up next. Yeah, um, thank you so much to our speakers. I mean, it's been awesome and exciting session. You know, we've had, this is probably the longest we've had and I feel like it's, she should still, you know, go on because of the um, thought provoking and insightful um, comments and I, you know, feedback that was also received from the, the speakers. Um, in short, my notepad notepad here is full, and I'm sure my fellow fellows uh, would have noted a lot of of, of points. Um, thank you to my chairman, Mr. Aswe Godalo. Um, worked with him over the years, and I wasn't expecting any less because he always has um, this idea of excellence and you know standards. So he will always charge you to to be the best and um, thank you for charging us to think, you know, of smart and innovative ideas, you know, to, to be able to address some of the problems that we are facing, and especially also for us to think of implementation, so not just ideas, but how they can um, be implemented. Um, thank you also to uh, uh, Dr. Jumoke Oduwale. I mean, I followed your work, you know, for so many years and very excited at the progress um, you've made. And I think one, one key aspect also um, that I always look forward to in your work is um, the ease of doing business reports, especially um, the fact that we've been able to domesticate it in Nigeria. We don't have to wait for the for the World Bank, you know, then to do their reports, you know, and for some reason, their report has been stopped too. And it's a very good thing that we have something locally to be able to assess, you know, um, areas where we've made progress and area where, areas where we need improvement. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and for sharing your experience. And thank you to Hajia Aisha Bubaka as well for providing insights on, on, on data and how this can be used to drive institutional um, change. So um, I'd also like to thank the, the FIT Foundation team, the, the institutes, the secretariat, you know, um, Bolatife and all of the, the, the your colleagues that you have there, you know, uh, at some point we've had issues and then we'll reach out to them the response has been, you know, remarkable. So on behalf of um, some of us here and the fellows, I'll say thank you so much for putting this together. And hopefully um, look out for us. We will reach out to you where we have, you know, problems, questions, concerns, and hopefully we will get to hear back from you. And look out for our reports as well. I'm sure it will be, um, it will add value to, to some of the problems, um, some of the things we, we've we've experienced in the country and also provide innovative solutions to some of the problems um, we face. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson. Okay, I see Omoshalawa clapping. <laughs> so I think you did a good job on behalf of all the fellows. <laughs> thank you, Omoshalawa. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you very much. I'll quickly invite Adinike to give closer remarks and it will be a wrap. Thank you so much for your time today. So thank you very much on behalf of the, of the chairman, the board, the management of Faith Foundation and our Faith Institute. Um, I would like to appreciate our three speakers. They are family, friends, um, and supporters in different ways. And again, uh, have given themselves um, to our conversation. So thank you very much, Mr. Aswe Igodalo. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, and thank you very much to Mrs. Aisha Abubakar. We're honored by your presence. We do not take it for granted that you accepted this, but you have even further charged not just the fellows, but even ourselves. If I would summarize the three or four um, things, because there are quite a lot of consistent themes around what the fellows should do and their thinking of the approach and all of that, without going to, into specific details for me, they were, we have to be bold and audacious around the Nigerian project. You know, uh, Dr. Duale said one economy team Nigeria, regardless of how things are now, we know the potential, the socioeconomic potential, the impact, and our focus is on the people that can and will drive our economy, drive and create our jobs, and really help in the transitioning that we know we have the potential to, be, to achieve. So for our fellows, our fellows, uh, you've charged our fellows to be bold and audacious. You've charged us to be well informed. Um, so even if we do not know that things exist, it's not an excuse for us to not look for them, to not find them, to not ask for them. You've charged us to be engaged, you know, to engage from the beginning, particularly with public sector, and really get strong ownership and buy-in, you know, and support them as well as we can, get their buy-in, get their insights, while also still working with, with the entrepreneurs. And then our policies really that can be focused on implementation, 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 really execution really is key. Those for me are the four, are the four, are the four nuggets that we've taken away. Congratulations once again to our fellows. Thanks for the last four weeks. So for some of us on the call, we've actually done this. This is the culmination of various onboarding sessions that we've had over the last four weeks, speaking with different people from the entrepreneurship segment, private sector, public sector around their work. And, and our inauguration today is, is really the culmination of the start. Uh, and then the journey comes. So we will definitely be sharing um, the journey with you and the, the insights, the policy papers, and even as we have engagement share, uh, sessions, we will be doing that with you. Um, I also want to mention that we have our eighth policy dialogue series on entrepreneurship, which will be happening during the Global Entrepreneurship Week. So please be on the lookout for that. We will be launching our 2022 State of Entrepreneurship Report and actually doing quite a deep lens um, uh, from access to funding. So please look out for that invitation. There are quite a lot of our friends and partners on the call and, and we, we see you, we say thank you to you. So on behalf of the Faith Foundation, um, I formally end today's session and the, the, the inauguration and we really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good afternoon. And thank you once again to all our guest speakers. We really do appreciate you and your extra one hour with us. Thank you. And Amaka and Oyegola and, and Atwari, our Faith Institute team um, that have done all the work and ensuring today was a success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone, a good week. Yeah. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. We will share the recording to all those that registered and we'll, we'll have that published. Thank you. Over to you, Amaka. Thank you. Thank you. So that's really it from our end. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for spending part of your Monday with us. Mondays are hectic, but you chose to be here. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye.